Thank you. So at this time, we will have the national anthem on the steel pan played by Mr. Jamal Jassani Glenn, researcher and registered music therapist at the NWRHA. So if you have not as yet, can you stand if you are, if anybody's in a wheelchair, of course, let's observe the national anthem of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, Ms. Lisa Agar, Chairman of the Board and the Board of Directors of NWRHA, the Executive Management of NWRHA as well, Dr. Erica Wheeler, Country Representative of PAHO and WHO, representatives from the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Digital Transformation and other regional health authorities, senior officers from our national security services, principals, faculty, representatives, and students from tertiary and secondary education institutions, researchers, judges, and other participants, staff of the NWRHA, all other specially invited guests, members of the public and of course the media, let me officially welcome you to the fifth annual Research Day 2023. Uh, this year's theme is entitled Mental Health Reframing the National Perspective. And let me take this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Ken Simmons, honored to be given the opportunity to host such an auspicious occasion. I know how much this event means to those involved. And uh, we're gonna have an informative day, yes, we're gonna learn uh, we're going to award a few people, but of course, overall, we're going to have a fun day. And if you're believing with me, can we put our hands together for that today? Yes? Yes. So there's a few things that I would like to remind some of you and inform others before we actually go to uh, another item on our program today. So, of course, when you came on the fourth floor, you, you probably would have been directed to sign the Muriel. I hope you did and left your, your nice remarks. I hope you did that. Also, uh, you were given a, a badge. Now, on that badge, uh, there's a QR code. So once you open up your camera, for those of you, you say, well, you know how to scan the QR code? Just open up the camera. And once, once you don't have a Me Too, right? I think we should be OK, right? We should be OK. And you, you scan the, the, the QR code and it will take you to eHealth TT app. So there you're gonna, of course, you're gonna find the agenda for today. We, we have a feedback form because feedback is very important. You know, hosting events like this, of course, there are a lot of players involved. So of course, we will always want to ensure that we get better as we go along for the sixth and the seventh. So we would like you, before the end of today's program, we would like you to fill out that. Also, very, very importantly, uh, there's the People's Poster Choice Prize for Best Poster, 
okay, uh, in the lobby you would have seen some of the researchers' posters and you would have had a chance to view it. So, you know, throughout the proceedings today, we would like you to take some time and cast your vote, right? We, we move with a democracy here, so we want you to vote for the People's um, Choice Prize for the best poster at the end of our session today. Right, so that being said, uh, it's, it's my duty and privilege to welcome our first speaker to deliver opening remarks. Please, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Ms. Lisa Agard, Chairman of the Board of Directors of NWRHA. Good morning, all. The Honorable Terence Dayal Singh, Minister of Health, Dr. Erica Wheeler, Country Representative for PAHO, WHO, Dr. Hazel Othello, Director of Mental Health, Ministry of Health, my fellow directors on the Board of Directors of the NWRHA, all invited guests, representatives, participants, and particular staff of the NWRHA. It is my pleasure to welcome you once again to our Research Day 2023 with particular focus on mental health. Mental health related issues are very real in Trinidad and Tobago with illnesses such as depression and anxiety being commonplace. According to a survey conducted by the Trinidad and Tobago Mental Health Association, 45% of respondents reported experiencing symptoms of depression and 37% reported experiencing symptoms of anxiety. Permit me to introduce you to John. We encountered John while traveling to visit the new Digo Martin Health Center. John and his friend were speaking about the new state-of-the-art facility. John asked his friend, so what are they going to do with the old health center? His friend replied, boy, they turned that into a place where the mad people go to get their injection. Verbatim, those were his words. In the next two years, John encounters some medical problems and as part of his diagnostic assessment and potential treatment, he is asked to visit the Dego Martin Behavioral Well Center. John will not go because by his reasoning, he is not mad and that is the place where the mad people go to get their injections. Let's talk about Jeanette, a 23-year-old final year student at the university. For the past few weeks, Jeanette has not been feeling well at all. Now, nothing is physically wrong with Jeanette as far as she can see. She does not have a headache or stomach ache. She also cannot identify a specific part of her body that is hurting. But she knows that something is wrong and she's feeling a daunting pain that she cannot describe. But Jeanette is a bright but relatively inexperienced young lady who has her whole career laid out in front of her. And since neither Jeanette nor her friends have been sensitized or educated on the signs and symptoms of mental illness, Jeanette will go on to exist with this unexplainable pain and heaviness for many years. Lastly, let's discuss James. James has attended the St. Anne's Hospital for inpatient treatment intermittently over the past two years. James does not require the level of care provided at the St. Anne's Hospital for inpatients but he also needs daily care and supervision that can be offered at a mental health and wellness outpatient clinic or center. I tell the stories of these three people 
because their journeys really encapsulate some of the biggest challenges associated with the delivery of mental health care. One, the need for mental health, treat, mental health care treatment, even for people who seemingly lead quote-unquote normal lives. Two, the lingering and deeply embedded stigma in our society associated with mental health. And three, the importance of decentralization of mental health care delivery in Trinidad and Tobago. There needs to be a shift in the national paradigm on mental illness and its treatment. There needs to be a national re-education on the importance of mental health. Correspondently, our health systems need to expand and adapt to the emergent mental health needs of the population. Hence, the NWRHA made the decision to strategically focus Research Day 2023 on mental health, and our authority stands prepared to act with the rest of the government and society to make the necessary changes. Mental health wellness, as you will all recall, came into sharp focus during the COVID-19 pandemic. I remember watching a COVID-19 press conference roughly about two years ago, where Dr. Khan, who we will hear from later, pointed out a study they conducted at the University of the West Indies on the psychological effects of the pandemic on the public of Trinidad and Tobago, which revealed that at that time, persons and I quote, were at a higher risk of depression, anxiety, stress, and other mental health concerns. With 17% of the respondents showing depression symptoms that required professional help, and 26.7% of the respondents with anxiety scores, which also required clinical attention. Folks, the need for attention to mental health has not diminished or disappeared because COVID is in the rearview mirror. And of course, the issues that we are seeing in Trinidad and Tobago are not unique to our country. Globally, 970 million people, almost a billion people, are affected by mental health or substance use disorders. One in every eight people in the world live with a mental health disorder. One in four people will be affected by mental illness at some point in their lives. 14.3% of deaths worldwide, or approximately 8 million deaths each year, each year, are attributable to mental disorders. In 2019, the global suicide rate was estimated at 10.5 per 100,000 people, with approximately 800,000 people dying from suicide each year, almost twice the number of people killed by malaria. Suicide deaths have risen by 20,000 over the past 30 years around the world, with suicide being considered the fourth leading cause of death among people age 15 to 29. Almost nine out of 10 people with a mental condition experience stigma and discrimination. With respect to the epidemiological burden of mental disorders, the global burden of, of, the, the global burden of disease study attributes nearly 15% of years of life lost to mental disorders, making mental illness one of the largest causes of disability worldwide. The economic value associated with this burden is estimated at about 5 trillion US dollars. The impacts are real and significant. It's no small issue. We at the NWRHA are continually looking for ways to improve healthcare 
which includes our mental health services. As the present management of the National Mental Health Services and with the only mental health hospital facility, that is the St. Anne's Hospital, we have a responsibility to our fellow citizens to ensure that the best quality of mental health care is provided to citizens of this country. So what have we been doing in recent times within the Northwest Regional Health Authority to improve mental health services? One, we recently expanded our music therapy program from three facilities to four, as we recognize the importance of multifactored approach to the management of mental health and the treatment of mental illness. In the, in the future, we intend to strengthen our agricultural program for patients through further development of administrative procedures. Two, we have recommenced our health outreach where mental health counseling by trained mental health professionals is offered as a standard service. These health outreaches can be requested by organizations that fall within the NWRHA catchment area. These include government ministries and agencies, private workplaces, NGOs, faith-based organizations, and community groups. Three, during the pandemic, we creatively developed additional digital products for our clients and employees, including the Just for Health just for the Health of It initiative, where we facilitated lectures on mental health and other topics on request. These continue. Four, one of the most significant developments is our move to expand our electronic health information system, which we call the eHealth platform, to the St. Anne's Hospital and the three mental health facilities within the NWRHA catchment area. Now, this digitalization of our health information systems did not start yesterday or even last year. This was a strategic action on the part of the authority to improve clinical support services, and this commenced in 2019 at the St. James Medical Complex. At St. James, we decided to digitalize patient records and other support services to improve the overall quality of care for patients for oncology and similar services. The benefits received from the implementation of the electronic health information system are far reaching and include, one, the reduction in patient wait times for access to health services Two, the pharmaceutical reduction in expiries and their associated costs due to digital inventory monitoring and reporting. And three, the enhanced ability to assess and improve health services. One of the most interesting things coming out of analysis now of three years of data for us at the, at the St. James uh, National Cancer Center is the fact that we realize that a large percentage of the patients who present at the at, at St. James actually die from cancer. Not because of the treatment or the quality of the treatment they receive, but because they present too late. And so from the analysis of this data, it has enabled us from a policy perspective to redirect uh, resources into prevention by pushing more mammograms and early testing for cancer so that we do not have the high rate um, of deaths associated with cancer and of course the costs associated with treatment of patients who present at stage four and stage five. Research Day in the Northwest Regional Health Authority has grown since its inception in 2017. We are proud to host our annual Research Day as this provides a forum for the strengthening and expansion of our national health research capacity. Our offering today will address themes 
such as reducing the stigmatization of mental health, so persons like John will not be afraid to visit the mental health and wellness center and come to an understanding that mental health is more than just giving injections to patients, and it's a more common issue that can affect up to a quarter of the persons sitting in this auditorium today. Today, we will also seek to explore the area of decentralization of mental health services, which I know is an issue very near and dear to the heart of Dr. Othello. So patients like James have more options to receive treatment services that are appropriate to both level and design such as our day hospital soon to be reopened at the Arima Rehabilitation Center. Lastly, we hope that this research day will inherently spark an evolution of our citizens' perceptions on mental health so that persons like Jeanette can be sensitized and educated on the signs and symptoms of mental health and take the steps that are necessary to access our mental health services as soon as they are needed. James, Jeanette, and John are real people. They are our patients. Folks, have a wonderful day today. Please visit all of the exhibitions. And if you have time, please find an opportunity to chat with the mental health experts, Dr. Shafi, who is here, and also Dr. Othello. Thank you. Chairman of the Board of Directors of the NWRHA, Ms. Lisa Eger. Put your hands together for her one more time. Thank you very much. At this time, we would like to invite to the podium and the stage Major Anthony Blake, Acting Chief Executive Officer of the NWRHA. Put your hands together for him as he comes. Good morning. The Honorable Mr. Terence Yard Singh, Minister of Health, Ms. Lisa Agard, Chairman of the Board of Directors and other directors of the Northwest Regional Health Authority, Dr. Erica Wheeler, Country Representative for the Pan American Health Organization, all invited guests, representatives, participants, and most importantly, my staff at the NWRHA. As Acting Chief Executive Officer of this organization, I would like to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you to the Northwest Regional Health Authority's fifth annual research day. This year's team, Mental Health, reframing the national perspective is especially important given the challenges that we have all faced in the past few years with the COVID-19 pandemic. At the Northwest Regional Health Authority, we believe that mental health is just as important as physical health, and we are committed to advancing research in this area. We recognize that mental health issues can affect anyone, regardless of age, gender, or background. And we want to do our part to improve the lives of those affected by these conditions. We firmly believe that our greatest asset is our people, and we are committed to the promotion of good mental health. The NWRHA's research day is important. Well-anticipated event for researchers, and it provides an opportunity for knowledge sharing, networking, feedback, professional development, and of course, recognition. Today, as we celebrate Research Day, it is important to recognize the significant impact that our work can have on mental health. Our research has the potential to develop new treatments and therapies that can help people struggling with mental health issues. We at the NWRHA also recognize that research is but only one piece of the puzzle. To truly make a difference in the lives of those struggling with mental health issues, we must also be advocates for change. This means promoting mental health awareness by reducing the stigma 
that often surrounds these conditions. It means making sure that those who need help can get access to it, no matter where they live or their financial situation. And it means supporting our employees in their own mental health journeys, providing the resources and tools to help them thrive. Thus, I am proud to say that the NWRHA has invested significant resources towards the improvement of our mental health facilities, as well as the services offered during the past year. These improvements include, but are not limited to, significant refurbishment works on wards 20, 21, 26, and 17 of the St. Anne's Psychiatric Hospital. We've also provided virtual training for a series of staff at the Children's Ward and the wider public in collaboration with the Children's Health Authority. We've also hosted and partnered with the legal fraternity to host the court-mandated forensic mental health assessment process for adults at the St. Anne's Hospital. We've done significant work supported by the ministry in terms of our PSIP program and have commenced the upgrade of the water recirculation system at the St. Anne's Hospital. And those of you all that know St. Anne's Hospital will know that water issues have been a perennial problem there. And I want to thank the, our board and the ministry for the support that they've provided in diverting significant resources towards our mental health facilities. You also heard my chairman speak to the day clinic restarting at the Arima Rehab Center. And I'm also proud to say that the board has approved significant works to be done at the Arima Rehab Center to facilitate same. I also want to reiterate one point that the chairman spoke about, which is our e-health platform. This is, has significantly improved our ability to manage patients. It has improved mental health delivery, even though it's in its embryonic stage. It has improved our ability to gather data, which allows us to make strategic decisions based on data. In closing, let us remember that mental health is not just an individual issue, but a social issue. As leaders in the research community, we have a responsibility to prioritize mental health for both ourselves and those around us. Let us take the time to check in with ourselves and our colleagues and to seek help where we need it. By doing so, we will not only better equip, be better equipped to carry out this important work, but we will also be setting an example for others to follow. Thank you. Let's make today count. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Chief Executive Officer of the NWRHA, Major Anthony Blake. At this time, we would like to continue the welcome and greetings as we call to the stage and to the podium, Dr. Erica Wheeler, the Pan American Health Organization Country Representative of Trinidad and Tobago. Put your hands together, give her a warm welcome as she comes. Honorable Terence Dalsing, Minister of Health, Ms. Lisa Agard, Chairman of the Board of Directors of NWRHA, Mr. Anthony Blake, Acting CEO of the NWRHA. I'd also like to recognize uh, my colleague, Dr. Hazel Othello, Director of the Mental Health Unit at the Ministry of Health, and fellow presenter, Dr. Katija Khan, clinical psychologist and keynote speaker, but also other chairs uh, here present today and staff of NWRHA, and of course the researchers without whom this day would not be possible. So welcome. Uh, I bring you greetings, not just on my behalf, but on behalf of my director. We have a new director, Dr. Jabas Barbosa as well as the Director General of WHO, Dr. 
Tedros Ghebreyesus. I want to thank Ms. Lisa Agard and the acting chair, Major Anthony Blake, for inviting Paho and inviting me uh, for this day. Um, it's my real pleasure to be here and to speak on a topic that is very dear to me. Um, many of you may not know, but both my parents worked at St. Anne's Hospital, so I know it very well. <laughs> um, I spent many hours of my young life uh, you know, at that institution, waiting on my parents to go home. So this, this issue uh, of mental health and reframing the national perspective is very important. And I also spent a lot of my professional career in the UK working in this area. So I really want to commend the management and the staff of NWRHA for not only undertaking this research day, but for taking the bold step of selecting the theme, mental health reframing the national perspective. I know that the ministry has already begun to do so under the leadership of the minister and Dr. Othello because we work very closely with them. Mental disorders, as you've been hearing, and psychoactive substance-related disorders are highly prevalent throughout the world and are major contributions to morbidity, disability, and premature mortality. In fact, mental, neurological, and substance use conditions account for 14% of the global burden of disease. Between 75 to 90% of people with these conditions do not and I emphasize, do not receive the necessary treatment despite the existence of effective treatment and all the advances in treatment. This represents the gap in mental health. The health profile and the physical well-being of the people of any nation are affected by the impact of mental health disorders. The importance of the social determinants of health must be recognized and acknowledged, and people should be equipped with the practical skills and opportunities to protect one's mental health. WHO recognizes that mental health disorders increase the risk of other diseases and contribute to unintentional and intentional injury, including self-harm. Earlier this week, Caribbean leaders on Monday and Tuesday met in Port of Spain to address the scourge of crime and violence in our countries. There were many components of that discourse, but among them, very importantly, was the role of mental health in terms of how it contributes to the development of the perpetrators from childhood upwards and how it affects those who are victims or survivors, as well as how the responders, those in the healthcare services and in the security forces are affected as they come into contact repeatedly with violence. We must seek to address the mental health needs of the various sectors of our society. The demographic transition means that there are many people across the Caribbean who are aging, but thanks to advances in public health and social welfare, the population has services in mental health that can address those needs of the elderly. While we recognize that dementias are not a natural consequence of the aging process, Age is indeed an important factor, so we must consider dementias as part of this landscape of mental health issues that need to be addressed. As such, with the dementia prevalence in the region of the Americas of about 6.5 to 8.5% and the growing numbers of elderly persons, it is anticipated that there will be an increasing number of persons living with dementia in the coming years. In fact, it is estimated that Latin America and the Caribbean will be the most affected region of the world. And with an increase of dementias from 3.4 million people in 2010 
to somewhere around 7.6 million people by the year 2030. Ongoing research in this area is very crucial to understand the impact of the growing numbers of persons living with dementia and the impact on health systems, on family members, on carers, particularly women who make up the majority of persons who act in the role of unpaid caregivers. The resources allocated by countries to tackle the burden of mental, neurological, and substance use conditions are insufficient, are usually inequitably distributed, and at times inefficiently used. Median public spending on mental health across the region of the Americas is a mere 2% of the health budget, and over 60% of this is allocated to psychiatric hospitals. Together, this has led to a treatment gap in many countries, which is more than 70%. The stigma, social exclusion, and discrimination that occurs around people with mental health disorders only compounds the situation. WHO recommends that health spending allocation should be in proportion to the health burden and that there should be parity between physical and mental aspects of health care. In practical terms, this means that physical and mental health services should be provided in an integrated manner and that the percentage of spending allocated to mental health services should be proportionate to the percentage of its attributable burden. It is indeed time to reframe the national perspective. But you may ask, how has BAHO responded? Well, we have a regional plan of action on mental health, which includes developing and implementing programs for promotion and prevention in the context of mental health systems and services. Examples of broad strategies for mental health promotion and prevention of mental illness throughout the life course include information campaigns, promotion of rights, programs for early childhood and life course skills, provision of healthy working conditions, and programs to protect against child abuse and other types of domestic and community violence. The Pan-American Health Organization has established a high-level commission on mental health and COVID-19 to support the organization and its member states in improving and strengthening mental health across the Americas. And we know that there has been a tremendous impact as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic on the mental health of citizens. The commission is composed of diverse representatives from health, social and political organizations, academia, civil society, and people with lived experience. Its mission is to develop guidance and recommendations to advance mental health in the region, which has been presented in their final report. Locally, at our country office here in Trinidad and Tobago, we have partnered with NGOs to support that work on adolescents using the arts to express themselves and ensure that their voices are heard. We've launched a stigma reduction campaign in collaboration with one of our partners where people are encouraged to sit and talk and share. You may have noticed the green benches placed at the UE St. Augustine campus, at the Mount Hope Hospital campus, at the Young Adult Library in Port of Spain. These are all spaces that we created, and we are seeking to partner with the private sector to, this, to expand this even further. It is recognized that sharing our stories and experiences is one of our greater tools in destigmatizing mental health and mental health crises. The goal in this campaign is to create spaces and opportunities for sharing to take place. We have health of primary care providers using something called the MHGAP to provide appropriate levels of mental health care in, in the primary care setting and to refer as needed. 
In closing, I wish to mention that PAHO has also developed a new mental health policy with input from member states. And this policy builds on lessons learned from the pandemic and proposes the use of improved and innovative approaches to mental health that utilize high level advocacy and a whole of society approach. And we integrate this into mental health at all levels. The policy proposes a course of action and a strategic framework with five lines of action. I will end by just briefly mentioning what these five lines of action are. First, building leadership, governance, and multi-sectoral partnerships and integrating mental health in all policies. Second, improving the availability, accessibility, and quality of community-based services for mental health and substance use. Third, advancing promotion and prevention strategies and activities throughout the life course. Four, reinforcing the integration of mental health and psychosocial support in emergency contexts. And lastly, fifth, strengthening data, evidence, and research. We at PAHO commend you once again for organizing this research day and for the selection of this important theme. We certainly look forward to working with you all to reframing the narrative around mental health in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Erica Wheeler, representative for PAHU. At this time, as we continue, uh, I would like to welcome the Honorable Minister of Health, uh, Terence Dial Singh, to offer his remarks. Put your hands together for the minister as he comes. Good morning. I was telling the front row before I came up here and Dr. Kang that after the CEO, the chairman and Dr. Wheeler spoke, I have little or nothing new or novel to say. Therefore, I'm going to throw caution to the wind and extemporize and I'm going to start off with a quote. God, I can't see anybody. Boy. Yeah, I'm going to start off on, with a quote from a local philosopher, poet, and entertainer. And when I finish that quote, you will tell me who that person is, right? Eh, hey, hey, look who. You know how long me really see you? It could about to be a year or two. Call a drink now. What we go do? Eh, eh, long time. Been a while since we bust a lime. Nothing ain't changed because you look, still look fine. Nadia, Professor Nadia Batson. We are here because of the sterling work of our doctors and nurses in person without masks because, as Nadia Batson said, it's been a year or two. Congratulations to our doctors and nurses <laughs> who have brought us through COVID. I could not have said it better. Dr. Othello, you agree? You do? Good. You could tell her I really have nothing to say. Huh? <laughs> so I'm going to make up time. So page four of this booklet talks about mental health services at NWRHE, and I quote, Trinidad and Tobago's current mental health service delivery model has its roots in a custodial, non-rehabilitative approach used since the 1950s. In 1958, a comprehensive mental health plan was produced, and in 1975, the sectorization plan was developed to relieve overcrowding at St. Anne's Hospital 
and integrate mental health services into public health, 1950s, 1975. SAH remains the main tertiary institution for the treatment of mental disorders. That's where we were. Allow me to borrow copiously from a paper delivered by Dr. Ashley J. Smith at the American Anxiety and Depression Association of the United States of America. And she says, let's honor May's Mental Health Awareness Month with a truth bomb. Our approach to mental health is broken. 1958-1975. She goes on, the gaps in mental health. I see two fundamental problems with our current approach to mental health. One, our system of providing care and intervention. Two, the other is society's view of mental health in general. These are certainly intertwined and both need to change. She goes on. Until recently, societal conversations about mental health have treated the topic like it is something that is only relevant for those suffering from a diagnosable mental illness rather than something that affects everyone. That is the problem. Regardless of how good or poor mental health is at that moment. You see the problems? She goes on, the shift. What would it be like if we approach mental health the same way as we do physical health? If we normalized it. Everyone, every single human being with a human brain needs to focus on psychological well-being. No one bats an eye when someone says they are joining a gym or working on their physical fitness. However, James, Jeanette, and John, that you spoke about, see you, in chair, in fact, we cheer them on. We view it as a positive thing, not as a sign of weakness or failure. But James, Jeanette, and John, because of stigma and institutionalized stigma in society, they don't see going to our wellness center as a positive thing. They see it as a sign of weakness and a sign of failure. Let's do the same with psychological strength, and that's what we are trying to do. Let's intentionally focus on building it and encouraging others to do the same. She goes on, our brains are amazingly plastic, meaning they can change. Believe me, I know. If anyone can change in this room, it's me. And we can do a lot to train healthy mental habits that can promote resilience and reduce mental illness. Are you seeing the same parallel between treating diabetes and hypertension before they become a crisis? But with mental health, we don't do that. Understanding how our minds work and their natural tendencies could reduce suffering related to mental illness. She goes on, rethinking mental health to reduce stigma. If I'm being completely open and honest with you, I don't even like the term mental health. And that's why we in Trinidad and Tobago, and since 2018, chose the term mental wellness, Dr. Othello. It separates out mental health as something different, something other than a, and it perpetuates stigma. Instead, we need to talk about health in a comprehensive way that includes mind and body. 
So the same way we encourage people to eat healthy, to exercise, we need to develop in our society those habits of psychological and mental wellness. The distinction between them truly is arbitrary. If there's a line between mental and physical health, I'm going to ask you for some feedback now. You could see I really have nothing to see this morning, eh? But I, th I think I'm doing all right. If there's, a sign, if there's a line between mental and physical health, it is blurry at best. Let me throw that out for some comment. Could you put up the lights in the audience? I want to see them. Can anybody tell me if they agree with that statement or not? If there's a line to be drawn between mental and physical health, it is blurry at best. Some feedback. Young lady, you look 21 years old. Do you agree or di disagree? Not you, Dr. Othello, you are not 21. <laughs> I was talking to the young lady behind you. Very blur blurry. Any other opinions? Dr. Othello is 25, not 21. Come, give me some feedback now, help me. It is Doc Dr. Bagan. Thank you. That's what I want to hear. Thank you. When left to their own devices, our mind tends to focus on the negative. Do you agree? Good. We naturally notice and remember negative stuff significantly faster than positive stuff. Correct? Skewing our life experience, our minds have a propensity towards worry and rumination, and if left unchecked, these habits up the chances of developing anxiety and depression. That tells you that so-called healthy people, that Nadia Batson said, you're looking fine. You may be looking fine, but are you fine? When you are fed a diet of negativity 24 hours a day. You see, I was linking our local poet and philosopher, Nadia Batson, into this. How good, eh? <laughs> our modern worlds set us up to be sleep deprived. Spend too much time indoors, being sedentary and on screens, and feel isolated. Is that a true statement? We don't live in tight-knit, supportive communities anymore. And what came out of Monday and Tuesday's discussion on violence as a public health concern was exactly that, and Dr. Khan was there. Our communities are failing our young men. So therefore they become prone to violence. Violence leads to breaking the law and that is a crime. Unfortunately, that social disconnection, not to mention social distancing, takes a real toll on our nervous systems and psyches. That is what we are faced with. So that's a problem. We have diagnosed the problem. What is the possible solution? The possible solution has to be, as this event tells us, rethinking the way we treat mental health. And the first thing we have to change is stop talking about mental health as a disease. Talk about wellness, encouraging people to be well. Dr. Paras Ram, Sita Ram, my brother, now see you here. What we did at the ministry back in 2018, 2019, was start to change the conversation and look at mental health as an NCD. Dr. Othello was there, as a non-communicable disease. And that national perspective 
was formalized by a cabinet note I took in September 2019, where I approached the cabinet with our plan to decentralize mental health and appoint a national director in the form of Dr. Hazel Othello. That would have set the scene for a paradigm shift in the way we think about ourselves as human beings. The journey has begun, but it is going to be a long, long journey. As another local philosopher said, if I could get the lyrics, the journey now start, the journey now start. Good. The journey has started. But changing a paradigm is going to take time, it's going to take effort, and as Dr. Wheeler said, it is going to take money. Because as a former Jamaican Prime Minister said, it takes cash. Come on, yeah. It takes cash to care. That model that we instituted talks about decentralization of mental health. Away from that coercive, institutionalized model that the clinical psychologist spoke about. When I came into office, St. Anne's had 1,000 patients. I think right now we're down to 725. Because we are returning patients back into their communities to continue their treatment and rehabilitation along a path of mental wellness. That old coercive method of throwing people into St. Anne's and literally throwing away the key and leaving them there for 30 years and 40 years serves no useful purpose once they can go back to their communities. Once they can become productive members of societies, reconnect with family. What we have done as policy is build our new hospitals with beds and wards dedicated to mental wellness. Whether it's Point Fortin, Arima, and the new central block in Port of Spain. The integration of mental health into primary care was a major step we took earlier this year, Dr. Othello, where we'll be treating mental issues and mental wellness at the primary care level in the same way we treat diabetes, hypertension, and so on. That's why I said we have to look at mental issues at the primary level as an NCD. Because what used to happen before, they'll be taken out of the primary setting and sent to St. Anne's. That is wrong. That is wrong. And we are training our doctors at the primary level in the diagnosing of these issues and the prescribing of the relevant medication. It is a work in progress, but it's a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift. So ladies and gentlemen, as I close, I want to assure you that in myself and in this government, you have someone and a government that believes that mental wellness is a priority. And I want to close with another verse from that local philosopher and poet. I'm glad to see you, my friend, from long, long time. Let me just take a wine. I want to hold on together and rock away the whole night. We have to stop living in isolation. That is what Nadia is telling us here. I don't know if when Nadia wrote these lyrics or whoever wrote these lyrics, thought that these lyrics could be so powerful. We have to stop living in isolation. 
are glad to see you, my friend, from long ago. Don't even want to go. I want to hold on together and rock away the whole life. My friends, thank you very much. Uh, the Honorable Minister of Health, Terence Yeltsin. Put your hands together for him one more time. I don't know, I just, feel, I just feel inspired after that greetings. I feel like I want to ask somebody for a wine afterwards in the interest. I don't know, I, I wouldn't be invited back. All right, I'm just saying that, you know, as the minister encouraged me, so. All right, let me behave myself. You know, before, before I go further, let me just share with you briefly. You know, we, we talked about, you know, people living with mental health issues and, the, the, you know, a stigma that people have the idea of, of what mental health is. And when I was younger, I grew up in the church, and people who have mental health issues, apparently it was a demonic spirit. Everything was a de demonic spirit. And you know, get all, bring the oil. And I'm not knocking that, obviously, because of course, I, everybody has their belief, but it goes beyond that. And I think uh, at the end of 20, 20, I had the opportunity to do Wellness Wednesdays with Ken Simmons and Miss Keisha Lewis. And, you know, we spoke and, uh, you know, even though I had a limited knowledge, it opened up my, my thinking and, and how I would approach people who are living with mental health issues. And I was grateful for that time and, and ever so often given an opportunity, you know, I'm able to speak not just from what was said to me, but from a factual point of view. So, you know, we, we appreciate seminars like this, and for me, I always like to learn. So I appreciate to be a part of this. And if you appreciate to be a part here, you know, put your hands together, yeah. <laughs> right, so, so before I bring on my keynote speakers, let me remind you, for those of you that probably need, you know, Wi-Fi connection, because I know you, you're eager to vote for the uh, People's Poster Choice, uh, you can log on to the Wi-Fi in the auditorium, right? It's uh, auditorium clients, and uh, the password is auditorium guests, all lowercase, all right? So you say, oh gosh, I ain't get a chance to top up your door. All courtesy be mobile, we've got you. Yeah, yeah. And if, if you are outside of the auditorium, there's another password because the, the connection is different. You can't say, well, right? You're making sure that they're taking care of you. So outside of the auditorium, it's B-Mobile 1, and the password is B-Mobile 1 or lowercase. So again, thank you, B-Mobile, for providing free Wi-Fi at our fifth annual Research Day 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Like, somebody wants a phone card there, but all right. Yes, B-Mobile. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. All right, so we move right along as we welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Khadija Khan, clinical psychologist. So let me, I know when you came in on t onto the floor, you would have looked to your, is it left, right? You would have seen the bio there. But let me take my time to, to share with you uh, her bio, right? Dr. Khadija Khan is a well-respected and accomplished consultant clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist, as well as a strong advocate for mental health. With over 20 years of experience, Dr. Khan has made a significant impact in the field of psychology by applying evidence-based principles to empower individuals, organizations, and communities to achieve healthy, adaptive, productive, and fulfilling function. Dr. Khan received her PhD in psychology from the University of the West Indies and is alumna of both the University of Hull in England and the University of Sheffield, also in England. Prior to repatriating to Trinidad and Tobago, she worked with these institutions as well as with the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Throughout her career, Dr. Khan has worked with a wide range of governmental, corporate, educational, philanthropic, and community partners, both internationally and throughout the Caribbean. She's a passionate contributor to civil society and works tirelessly to increase the impact 
of psychology and well-being in society. In addition to her extensive professional experience, Dr. Khan holds a number of key roles that allow her to make a difference in the field of mental health and psychology. She's a commissioner of the PAHU High Level Commission on Mental Health and COVID-19, as well as a lecturer in psychology at the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of the West Indies. Dr. Khan is also the president of the Caribbean Alliance of National Psychological Association, abbreviation CAMPA, a board member of the Mediation Board of Trinidad and Tobago, a commissioner for the Public Health Commission in Trinidad and Tobago, and a director on the board of the Coalition Against Domestic Violence. She's also a member of the regional UE COVID-19 Task Force the Trinidad and Tobago Ministry of Health MHPSS Technical Working Group and the Trinidad and Tobago NCRHA Regional Health Committee. Additionally, Dr. Khan serves on the Board of Directors for the Silver Lining Foundation. Dr. Khatija Khan's commitment to improving mental health and well-being in society is evident throughout her extensive experience, impressive accomplishments, and ongoing dedication to work. Can we have a hearty round of applause as we welcome Dr. Khatija Khan, please. Thank you, Mr. Simmons, for that glowing introduction. Um, the Honorable Mr. Terence de Alsing, Minister of Health, Ms. Disa Agard, Chairman, Board of the NWRHA, Ms. Anthony Blake, CEO of uh, the NWRHA, Dr. Erica Wheeler, Country Rep, PAHO, NWHA representative, Dr. Hazel Othello, Director of Mental Health, Distinguished awardees, ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct pleasure to be here with you this morning, uh, to be a part of and celebrate this research day with you. I was here at the last one, so it's fantastic to see it continuing and growing from strength to strength. And today I want to share with you um, some of my thoughts uh, based on the theme of today's research day, which is reframing the national perspective. And so I wanted to share with you, bullfacedly, some perspectives I think should also be considered and pondered upon in the reframing of this national perspective. We've heard of some of the tremendous accomplishments that have been taking place in different sectors from all of our speakers. And thus far, this reframing seems to be one that is headed in the right direction by being more inclusive, more accessible, more comprehensive. But there are still ways that we can think of that we can improve. So in 2022, recently last year, the World Health Organization published its second World Health Report, World Mental Health Report, 20 years after the landmark first edition. And if you haven't had a look at this yet, I urge everyone to download a copy it's easily accessible online, and it speaks about different priority areas, but I wanted to highlight one of the quotes from this report. Very simply put, business as usual for mental health simply will not do. So while we have heard of all the accomplishments and the progress, we cannot afford to sit by and say, okay, we've done enough, we can let mental health run its course. No, there is much more that we can be doing. And so in sharing some perspectives for you to ponder, I have five areas that I'd like us to think about. And the first one, we, we've heard already about the importance of mental health and mental well-being. And I want to emphasize and reiterate how critically important it is. Mental health is critically important, and we need all hands on, on deck. So mental health, and I also agree there is no line between mental and physical health. They are inextricably linked. Mental health is integral and necessary for us to do everything, to be able to function, to cope, to thrive. 
And we also need to remember, sometimes when we think of mental health, people automatically think of mental illness, and then we go to a dichotomy with people who are, are living with mental illness and then the rest of, of people. But we know that that's a false dichotomy. Mental health exists on a continuum. Now it is a complex continuum, and uh, there are many different factors that affect our position on our continuum at different stages in our lives. So if we are having very fulfilling, productive lives, we're having opportunities to succeed, then we're going to move up that continuum. But if we are subject to adverse circumstances and experiences, if we have a genetic predisposition to certain illnesses, and then we have additional stresses that we face in our daily lives, these are the things that can move us down the continuum. But the good news is that there are many protective factors that can buffer us and keep us where we want to be. And not just in a comfort zone where, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work, I'm showing up, but I'm existing in a comfort zone. What we want for our society is for people to thrive, for people to be at their optimal wellness, not just getting by. And this pandemic brought to the fore, this pandemic threatened the mental health, not just the physical health, but it threatened the mental health of millions of people across the world. And it also exacerbated and widened the treatment gap. We heard Dr. Wheeler mention this treatment gap, and that's the difference between the number of persons who are living with a mental health condition and the number of persons who are able to access treatment. So with an increase in demand of services with the pandemic and also it compromised some of the ability to deliver services, we saw a widening of that treatment gap, which of course we need to address. And so what does that call for? Devoting so much more attention and resources. Education, awareness, intervention, service delivery and evaluation. But it also calls for a multi-sectoral approach working in tandem with the Ministry of Health. And so I wanted to highlight some of the positive things that have been taking place and also give some suggestions for areas uh, of further development. So this is an initiative of the Ministry of Health's uh, um, Technical Working Group for MHPSS. It's called FineCare. This is one of the deliverables of that working group called FineCareTT.com. And this provides a directory of online services. But here's the exceptional thing about this working group. And I really, at this point, do want to commend the chair of that working group, uh, Dr. Hazel Othello, our director of mental health. Let me tell you what the, what the exceptional quality of this technical working group. It brought together stakeholders from every relevant sector of the society. So we have private NGOs, we have government stakeholders, we have other entities, and also it's open, so other uh, stakeholders are, are free to join at any point in time. So you see here just a, a cross-section of some of these um, um, uh, stakeholders. Um, and as for the next slide, the IT did in such a fantastic job. I'm advancing these slides here and I forgot to, to signpost them, but they're doing a fantastic job. Thank you, IT. Uh, the next, uh, next slide also highlights um, one of the regional efforts that are being made. So you would have heard about this PAHO High Level Commission on Mental Health that I was appointed to. And in June next month, we, they will be launching the report that speaks to some of the recommendations uh, that will be, we are making to the region, to governments, to organizations, et cetera. And um, just as a teaser, Trinidad and Tobago is featured uh, twice in there as a, um, uh, an example of best practices that other nations can model as well. <laughs> and your applause uh, it's, it's for yourselves as members of the Ministry of Health and uh, the regional uh, health associations because those practices that will be highlighted speak to the efforts that, that, that the ministries are making and the different um, uh, stakeholder units are making. Right? I also wanted to highlight in terms of the expanding of the notion of mental health has just been situated between health and health related sectors. Um, and 10 years ago, 10 years ago at the World Economic Forum, 
the role of other sectors was highlighted. So we know that most adults spend more wake, waking hours at work than anywhere else. Take just a few seconds to reflect on that. Yeah? So therefore, your work environment becomes critically important and it has a lot of influence on your mental health for those of you who are working. So against the challenging and evolving economic landscape, keeping workers healthy continues to be a, a vital uh, cause. Yeah? And this evolution reinforces the need to advance wellness in the workplace and to improve global health and productivity. So at the Davos meeting of the World Economic Forum 10 years ago, they highlighted this and they formed an institute for health and productivity management. And so employers are now being asked to play a role in promoting and enabling and creating an enabling environment for healthier behaviors through workplace wellness programs. And we see that these can benefit both physical and mental health. And so here we're seeing uh, a widening of what, when we speak about that multi-sectoral collaboration. Um, my other perspective is one that has um, uh, been in progress in Trinidad and Tobago for a number of years. And it is a work in progress. It's not an, an easy thing to just suddenly do. Uh, and just to use some of our local parlance, deinstitutionalization is a must. Yes? What is that? When we speak about that, we're talking about the shift away from care and support uh, in long-stay psychiatric hospitals like St. Anne's to community mental health services. And it was very good to hear from Major about the um, uh, resumption of, of the day clinic at the Arima Center. And, and, and that is what the institutionalization involves. There are many benefits. The literature is quite clear. The research is quite clear. Uh, better independence, quality of life, but there are many challenges as well. Deinstitutionalization can also um, lead persons to face more rejection and more stigma and more victimization and harassment in their communities. And therefore, this process must put things in place to address that. So any effective plan for deinstitutionalization must consider all of the necessary components, not just providing services in the community, but also the wraparound services that are necessary uh, to provide for all of the care needs of the, of the population. So the National Institutes of Mental Health in England identified nine components for um, facilitating recovery in the community, and these include, um, and of course this is additional to providing the clinical care. So in addition to that, what do we need? We need the family support, we need peer support, um, work and meaningful activity. So people need to, when we reintegrate them into communities, we need to provide them with means to live fulfilling and productive lives. Um, they need to have personal power and agency, um, community involvement and education, access to resources like technology, so they could use some of these um, telehealth, e-health services that are going to be available. And finally, the minimization of stigma, and I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Uh, and this deinstitutionalization, to just also reiterate the need for this multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary collaboration uh, is very critical for the success of initiatives like these. And I, I must say, to, to stand here as a psychologist, uh, being invited to deliver a keynote at the regional, at the end of your RHA's um, uh, research day. I consider it uh, particularly uh, an honor that you're including. Um, you are putting your, the money where your mouth is in terms of uh, making this a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, this was also, and we're seeing more shifts towards that or more recognition of the need for this approach. The pandemic, taught us a very good lesson. We could provide the vaccines, but that doesn't mean people are going to take them. And so it highlighted the need that we have to have a better understanding of how people and societies make decisions about their health. Yes? And this is a, a quote from Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus of the uh, WHO. And so 
six months into the pandemic, the World Health Organization convened its first technical advisory group on behavioral insights and science for health. And they convened experts from across the world, from psychology, anthropology, health promotion, social and behavioral sciences, etc. So we might not think that some of these disciplines have direct um, relation to, to health, but they do. They do. And what we find is that when we combine uh, these um, uh, different sorts of expertise, we get the synergy and we're able to have more, plan more effective interventions. Okay? So as I speak about interventions, my next uh, perspective talks about the kinds of services that we're going to deliver, the kinds of interventions that we want, uh, that we do have and we want to implement. And I want to say that we need more evidence-informed best practices. Are we responding to our society's needs? What are the areas that we have identified as priorities for us? And are those services fitting that need? Have we evaluated them to make sure that they are valid, that they are evidence-based, they're effective, they're rigorous, they have the standards that we want them to be? Okay. Um, we heard the minister speak of integrating mental health into primary health care. And the ministry has been doing a lot of work in terms of rolling out the MH Gap program. And they continue to do great work. So I've also worked on them on some projects in terms of evaluating the implementation of MHGAP uh, where it is now and also developing a national operational plan to roll out MHGAP for wider reach. So what is MHGAP? It is um, a World Health Organization initiative that aims to scale up care for mental, neurological and substance use disorders in primary care. So that this is not going to be um, specialized care where you have to wait to see a two or three doctors before you see a specialist. No, we're going to build capacity and competency in primary health care practitioners so that people can access services wherever they are in their communities once they are accessing a clinic or a service provider. Okay. Other initiatives um, that are uh, in training that are taking place that are based on evidence and research, I wanted to highlight um, two of them. Uh, so both these projects are related uh, to some of my work I'm doing with the School of Nursing. I'm not sure if the director is here, Dr. Ocho, but we also have a paper, uh, a poster um, outside on one of these projects. So one of them um, on your left, uh, it's, it speaks to it was a project funded by the Spotlight Initiative, um, and it speaks to developing curricula for mental health, for public health care professionals to deliver more um, sensitive care for survivors of gender-based violence. So two curricula have been developed, one for students and also one for practitioners, and this is expected to be rolled out as well. The other project, um, speaks to disaster-related uh, mental health capacity training for nurses across the Caribbean. The first training was undertaken in 2019. We brought nurses uh, and other mental health care practitioners from 17 countries um, to Trinidad, and they got face-to-face -face training. The pandemic stymied it a bit, but then we were able to um, uh, complete the second leg of training last year in Barbados and we do have a manual um, that it was a training of trainers so that they can now replicate this um, training in their home countries. And um, next week I hope to be in uh, South Africa to participate in some more training. So last year the WHO also launched its EQUIP uh, project ensuring quality and psychological services. And they started, they piloted in a few countries, and then we were at Trinidad and Tobago, we were invited to be a part of that. And uh, as the regional focal point, this training, I'm going to attend this training to be able to, um, the idea is to come back. So Dr. Teller, you'll be hearing more about this when I come back. The idea is to roll this out for healthcare professionals in the country. And what it is, is it's speaking to improving the consistency 
and quality of training and service delivery as it relates to psychological services. So we're not relying on individual practitioners' um, idea of what delivering psychological support looks like. We want to standardize um, the evaluation. We want to standardize the competencies. And this is going to improve the service delivery and the quality of the service. So look out for more information on this. Um, and one last project I wanted to, to mention, which I think are, are areas for us as well that we can develop further. Uh, and you can see that both of these um, articles that I've referenced here are 2023. So they're hot off the press. We're talking about initiatives that are currently being developed. So the first one speaks about a single session intervention for psychological services. So one of the barriers um, in, in, in that treatment gap is that the care that they need, it takes a lot of time and many sessions. But this study looked at to see whether just one session for psychological support can be of benefit. And so it's promising. They found that 50% of the patients that they um, interviewed said that it was helpful. Yeah? Um, increasing telemental health uh, services. Uh, it was fantastic to hear about the e-health services. I look forward to hearing more about that. And the final one uh, here, Cognospeak, is one of the, this is some of my research collaborators from the University of Sheffield, where I worked prior to repatriating, and they're developing tools. This is an AI tool, okay? So you are speaking uh, to a digital doctor. This is artificial intelligence. And you speak to the digital doctor, they appraise you and they're analyzing speech. Because the science has told us that uh, in things like Alzheimer's disease, the quality of your speech is affected in the early stages. So they're trying to see if this can be an effective screening tool. And they brought me in recently because they have, they've been piloting it in different communities. And um, with their, Sheffield has a, a large minority uh, Somalian population, and I do work in cross-cultural assessment. So they were discussing how can we make this tool more culturally valid? Because when you use it, it the, an avatar comes up. I remember one of the interesting questions we wanted to hear from um, the community group was, for the avatar, did it make more sense to have an avatar with natural looking hair or should they have a hijab on? Okay. Now, you might be thinking that seems kind of minor and flimsy, but here's the thing. With the digital technology, if you have the natural hair, you get more natural head movements. If you put a hijab on an avatar, you don't get the natural movement. It looks a little bit more artificial. But when we spoke to the community, because so many of them were Muslim, they preferred to have a digital doctor with a hijab if it were a female um, digital avatar. And so that was helpful for us because we want tools that, that, are going, that people are going to feel comfortable using, et cetera. So these are avenues that we can also um, build upon more in the Caribbean to expand services. And then my fourth um, of five <laughs> uh, speaks to stigma. Stigma continues to be one of the biggest barriers for access and utilization of services. And we heard it mentioned by our speakers. And the stigma exists at all levels. So it's not just in the communities, there's, st there's stigma among providers. And then people can also internalize stigma, and we call that self-stigma. And that can also be a huge barrier to their recovery and, and positive outcome. So we need to think about some of the language. There are different aspects to stigma, and I just want to highlight one or two of them. We need to think about some of the language you use to describe mental health in our daily lives. And when we continue to use these stigmatizing words very casually, we reinforce feelings of shame. We reinforce stereotypes and labels associated with mental health difficulties. But if we start to change the words we use, it's going to make it easier and more comfortable for people to reach out when they need that help. And I want to commend some of the initiatives of the ministry. I think it was in 
2017, there was a, a PAHO ministry initiative for media training on the reporting of suicide. And then there's been more recent guidelines available online on the reporting of suicide, very critical, because we know when it's reported in ways that are not up to standard, it contributes to stigma. Uh, PAHO also has an online course, um, self-led uh, and tutor-guided course. I participate as a tutor on this course. And I really want to commend Trinidad and Tobago in general, because we had the highest participation across the region from Trinidad and Tobago. And I think there are some people in this room who may have been participants in this course. And it's offered annually. Uh, we had a pilot and then we had our second last year, it was a second delivery, and it should be offered again. I encourage anyone who's involved in primary health care, mental health care, you can apply for this. It is free. There's no cost involved. You just need the commitment to take part in the entire course. As we speak about watching our language, and we've already heard our minister quote from one of our local philosophers. Um, I don't know if many of you recognize this quote from another local philosopher, the late Sprangalang, who always used to tell us about what your contents. And for that, for your contents today, I mean your language. Yeah? And these are just little glimmer of some of the stigmatizing language that we use and we hear. So on the left side, when we speak about a schizophrenic patient, so we use the adjective there, or speaking of somebody who's retarded, or somebody who commits suicide. And then many people in their daily lives use words like, oh, my ex was so bipolar, I don't want nothing to do with him no more, no? Yeah? Uh, or, oof, that mess, it triggers my OCD. Yes, no, I can't see it. And then the middle one, I don't know if anybody has been watching Love is Blind, and I'm deliberately using a popular um, uh, Netflix show, because that show probably reaches thousands more Trinidadians than we have in this audience here. And in the reunion episode, one of the um, ladies spoke about seeing, because in that show, you speak to someone without having seen them, and then the hope is you fall in love to prove that love is blind without having seen them. And she, she was commenting that she heard his voice and she had PTSD. <laughs> and so not only is it misusing the term, but when we casually use terms like that, we really do undermine the valid and legitimate experiences who are living with mental health conditions. So I do urge us to watch your contents and think about the ways we need to rephrase our language, learn different ways of expressing ourselves. So when I was a graduate student 15 years ago, um, in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Psychiatric Disorders, there was the term mental retardation. That term, however, is no longer appropriate and it's obsolete now. So we speak of intellectual disability. We don't say a person commits a suicide because that term commit has been associated with committing a crime and committing some sort of offense. So we say someone dies by suicide. That's also in the media reporting guidelines as well. We don't speak of a schizophrenic patient where we put the emphasis on the disorder. We speak of a person or a patient living with the condition. And when it comes to our daily use, Here's your short term. Just leave the DSM out of it. Just don't speak of, of, of clinical diagnoses and labels. If you want to say that, um, you know, your ex was moody, say that. If you want to say that you don't like to see disorder, it makes you anxious, say that. If you want to say you heard his voice and you had a flashback, say that, <laughs> right? So let's not use these terms. These terms do not help. And these terms don't contribute to awareness and psychoeducation. They perpetuate stigma. So that's my challenge uh, for you today. Um, and as I move to, uh, and, and this also is just for inspiration. So I found this years ago, and I used some examples with my students. This is University of Penn. They have a pen listening lab, and they have been collecting stories from staff, uh, clinicians, patients, caregivers, and it's about emphasizing the power of listening. It's not talking about the cutting-edge clinical 
uh, interventions and care. We, that's out there, there are spaces for that. What we don't have are enough spaces that talk about the importance of compassion, listening, empathy, being sensitive. And so this, this site here gives a lot of these examples. And finally, uh, for all of us, my last perspective for us to consider is that we must hold ourselves to higher standards for mental health. Okay? Yes, by all means, when we achieve goals and there are successful initiatives, we must take the time to appreciate that. But there's always more work to be done and there are always ways that we could improve. And this here is a picture of... Um, uh, the disaster mental health training that took place in Hilton in 2019. I told Ms. Smith Kwanzaa, who's in the audience today, I, I pre-warned her, she didn't know I was gonna use this picture and maybe some others are here as well. Dr. Ocho is in that picture as well. Um, but for all of the professional organizations, I wanna throw this out. The Medical Board of Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago Association of Psychologists and Nursing Council, uh, the social workers, the OTs, the speech therapists, the physiotherapists, um, I really want to urge us to continue to demand better from ourselves, to regulate ourselves. Uh, and as we demand better, let's think about, we know that mental health needs more in the budget. And Minister, I, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> to, to, to just... You know, Jan, and, and, and I know this, I know that there, I don't think anybody here will disagree with this, that, that we, we need to advocate for more and more resources for mental health, but we also need to advocate for better quality of services. We need to have more evaluation of the services we are currently delivering. Are they fit for purpose? Are they actually helpful? Are we getting that feedback from the service users themselves? rather than we ourselves evaluating ourselves. Yes, I think I do a great job, thank you very much. No, we need to hear from the service users. Yes, are they satisfied? Are they improving? And if not, it can't be business as usual. And in all of this, we need to recognize the human rights of patients. Patients living with mental health conditions are the easiest sector to discriminate against. Yeah, the amount of stigma and rejection they face in communities, it's easy to overlook the human rights of patients living with mental health conditions. And finally, the professional standards. At uh, the Trent Tobago Association of Psychologists, we have been working on um, legislation to regulate the profession. So hopefully in this year, um, you're going to see hear more about that. And that's also in collaboration with the Ministry of Health where we want to have a licensure for psychologists. At the Caribbean Alliance at CAMPA, we are working on uh, promoting this across all of the Caribbean. We only have two to three countries uh, currently where we do have licensure, and so we would like to promote this across the region. We need to hold our professionals accountable to ethical standards, and when there are breaches in professionalism and ethical standards, there must be repercussions. It can't be business as usual. So, Thank you very much for your engagement. And I want to leave you with uh, a quote. It's actually from an, an American actress, but I thought it was very apropos. What mental health needs is more sunlight, more candor, more unashamed conversation. We have no shortage of sunlight in Trinidad and Tobago. Yes? But what we need is more of the latter. More candor, plain talk about what our priorities are, where we have what, acknowledging our strengths, but recognizing where the gaps are, and more unashamed conversation as we break down stigma and we reinforce and reiterate that mental health will and always be everybody's business. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. going to be deliberate in my words. I think that was a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Khatija Khan, clinical psychologist indeed. So I hope that in, in her discourse you would have picked up a few things well that you would take with you for the rest of your life.
So at this time, based on, um, of course, as we, we move forward, I would like us to just stand. I understand that the Honorable Minister has to leave at this time. So we want to say thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for gracing us with your presence. Thank you very much. Um, and I understand that uh, uh, Dr. Hazel Otello, too, as well, is he she's leaving? No? OK, good. All right. Well, they set it up. <laughs> Dr. Wheeler, okay. All right, okay, thank you very much to Dr. Wheeler. Put your hands together for Dr. Wheeler. You know, I've been doing this for many years, so it's so important that the, that the MC get the right information because he can say the wrong thing and, well, we know what I am saying, all right? So thank you very much, Dr. Wheeler, and of course, the Honorable uh, Minister Terence L. Singh. So at this time, based on our program, we have several uh, awardees. Okay, we have carded four awardees as we're gonna recognize them with their contributions to mental health services. Now I understand that two is absent today, so let me make mention of the two that is absent. Uh, we would like to recognize in their absence, Mrs. Jennifer Baker Defoe, RMN and RN, Retired Nursing Supervisor. Put your hands together for her in our absence. And also Mr. Richard Johnson, Physical Education Instructor. He's not here, but we would like to acknowledge him in his absence. So there are two others that we would like to recognize today with their contributions in mental health services. Uh, the other, is Pundit Dr. Rampasad Parasram, former medical doctor of St. Anne's Hospital. So Dr. Rampasad, well, before, before I actually let you know of, of his, his accomplishments, I would like to ask the Deputy Chairman, uh, Dr. Leslie Roberts, doc, uh, Deputy Chairman of the Board of Directors of the NWRHA to come to the stage to present Awards. Oh, I could do it. I could do it. In any case. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Am I there? No? All right. Okay. Dr. Leslie Roberts. Okay. Okay, Dr. Otello. Okay, all right, okay. I'm going good so far, don't worry. <laughs> all right, so Dr. Otello will, will, will substitute, all right? So let me let, let you know a little bit about Dr. Rampasad Parasram. He's a highly respected medical practitioner who has made significant contributions to the field of psychiatry and held numerous leadership positions. He obtained his medical degree from India and completed his postgraduate training in psychiatry in the UK. He served as the former me medical chief of staff at St. Anne's Hospital and principal medical officer and chief medical officer at the Ministry of Health. Dr. Parasram also played a pivotal role in the development of the country's mental health plan, which was adopted by cabinet in 2000. He has contributed to education as a lecturer at Nihurst and UE. In 2010, Dr. Parasram was awarded the Public Service Medal of Merit Gold for his contribution to the development of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Rampas Rampasad Parasram contributions to mental health uh, advocacy or advocacy, however you want to term it, healthcare leadership and community development have left a lasting impact on the country. Dr. Rampasad Parasham, we express our gratitude for your exceptional service. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Dr. Rampasad Parasham. As he comes. So, any photographers? 
the talk of us coming out without your trip. Man, come, come. So we have, uh, out of the four awardees of those who have contributed to the mental health services, we have one more, and we would like to acknowledge Dr. Ian Hippolyte, former medical director at St. Anne's Hospital. Now, Dr. Ian Hippolyte is a distinguished medical professional who has contributed extensively to the field of psychiatry. He served as a consultant psychiatrist and former medical doctor of the St. Anne's Hospital from 2004 to 2012, where he continues to provide exceptional care to his patients. His expertise in the field of psychiatry has made him a highly respected member of the medical community. Aside from his dedication to medicine, Dr. Hippolyte is also passionate about athletics. He's a coach at the Memphis Pioneers Athletics Club, where he mentors young athletes and promotes healthy lifestyles. In recognition of his contribution to psychiatry, he was awarded with the prestigious Hummingbird Gold Medal in 2018. Throughout his career, Dr. Hippolyte has demonstrated, demonstrated a deep commitment to provide quality care for his patients. He has been a leader in his field and his contributions have made a significant impact on the lives of many. His legacy continues to inspire future generations of medical professionals to make a difference in the lives of his patients. Thank you to Dr. Ian Hippolyte for your significant contributions. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Dr. Hippolyte. So we want to we thank Dr. Otello for filling in so very well. We appreciate that so very much. So those were the, the two awardees for the mental health services who are presently here. The fifth awardee is an individual with, who have made sterling contributions uh, in, in research And we would like to acknowledge Professor Jamil Ali, Professor of Surgery and former director of the Director of Women's Health and Breast Surgery Unit at the St. James Medical Complex. So let me, let me read a few of his sterling achievements and accomplishments. Professor Jamil Ali is an accomplished breast surgical oncologist and educator with a distinguished career spanning over five decades. After completing his degree of medicine from the University of Manitoba in 1966, Professor Ali pursued his surgical residency at the Winnipeg General Hospital and later completed a fellowship in trauma and critical care, culminating in a master's of medical education. He then began his mentorship in breast surgical oncology at the St. Michael's Hospital Breast Center, University of Toronto from 1998 to 2006, and sub subsequently completed a fellowship in breast at St. Michael's Hospital, University of Toronto from 2008 to 2010. Since 2013, Professor Ali has been a breast surgical oncologist at the St. James Medical Complex in Trinidad, where he was appointed as the Director of Women's Health and Breast Surgery Unit in 2016. 
He's also a consultant surgeon at the St. Michael's Hospital and the University of Toronto and holds various academic positions, including professor of surgery at both the University of Toronto and the University of Manitoba. Professor Ali's significant contributions to the field of surgery and oncology have earned him numerous awards, including the Scott Frey Memorial Lecturer Recognition Award, the Trauma Recognition Award, and the Dr. Vincent J. Hughes Physician Humanitarian Award. He, he has published extensively on topics ranging from trauma and surgery to cancer genetics and treatments, and his work has had a significant impact in the field. Professor Jamil Ali remains an active researcher within the NWRHA. Professor Ali's extensive expertise and dedication has made, him, has made him an exceptional leader and mentor in his field. His legacy of excellence continues through the many individuals he has mentored through his career. Thank you, Professor Jamil Ali, for your sterling contributions over the years. Thank you very much for your kind, <coughs> kind words. I, um, I think I'll be, I, I'm very happy to, um, to receive this award, of course, and um, grateful to the NWRHA for uh, so doing. But I will be remiss if I do not mention the true people who are responsible for the work that I've been able to do since I have had the opportunity of coming back to my home country and participating in the research. <clears throat> These people, when I first came here um, in breast surgery, I realized that there was, um, there was an inordinate number of patients who in, the, in their very prime of life were dying from breast cancer. And I felt there was something really wrong about this and I tried to find out what it was. <clears throat> and there was the big, beginning of a research project on genetic mutation in breast cancer. And in fact, the people from uh, Miami and U University of Toronto had already come here and they had already given some w money through the Coleman Foundation uh, towards that effect. But I had to beg them to bring some more money to find out what's happening in Trinidad and Tobago. Why is it that we have so many young people dying of this virulent uh, form of breast cancer? And in fact, we found that we do have a higher risk of genetic breast cancer in Trinidad and Tobago. And that has allowed us now to be very sensitive to the presence in our community. And it has allowed us to identify the, this high risk group of patients and now we are able to proactively save those patients' lives by preactive prophylactic surgery and very close surveillance. Now, uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Wheeler, uh, Erica Wheeler, has been very helpful in getting us also to start the project that we're gonna report on, on the uh, psych psychological effects of, uh, of cancer on the patient and we'll be talking about the survivorship uh, program. But one of the very exciting research projects that I've been involved in, that, and I, I can tell you, I just happen to be fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to participate in these projects because I happened to come here at the time that these things were taking place. Something that is very, very important that's taking place in this uh, country and in, in, in the Caribbean, the Afro-Caribbean community, is that for years, for years we have reported on how there are certain cancers that behave very differently in the Afro-Caribbean community. And we talked about it and we reported about it and nothing much has been done. Fortunately, the Pfizer pharmaceutical company has assisted a group of people. We call ourselves the Afro-Caribbean Caribbean Cancer Consensum. And that group has put together people from 12 countries, from the United States, the Caribbean, and the African continent. 
to try and find out why is it that our people are dying from the same disease that other peoples are surviving. There's something wrong. And what we're doing with this research is to try to determine what those features are. When we find what those features are, and our present project is going on to 2025, when we find those features are, what those features are, then hopefully we can tweak them and hope we will make a dent in this cause that is causing so many deaths on our young people. And that is due to those people. I tell you the people from the Afro-Caribbean community that are part of this particular project. They're from different parts of the world. We are, we are just guys that are partners in it, but it's a strong group of Afro-Caribbean women. The intelligence, the excitement, the enthusiasm, and so on, is driving this research project. And hopefully, we'll get answers that will make a difference in the outcome of the patients who are dying. I thank you very much for this award. By the way, my mom's name is Khadija. Professor Jamil Ali, put your hands together for him, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Dr. Otello, you know, any, anybody who has made a commitment to themselves to dedicate their life towards a cause is worthy of, of praise and admiration. And so, just hearing you speak for a brief moment, we, we thank you for taking up that cause and, and may your legacy live on for the work that you have done many years. Put your hands together for him one more time. Thank you, sir. All right, so at, at this time, uh, we, we have a, a coffee break, all right? Pie and juice and tea, I know them kind of thing, but they say coffee break here, all right? Uh, just, just a note, just a note, before, before we, we, we have a, a small intermission or a coffee break, as it says on the agenda, uh, I would like to ask the board of directors, the executive management, and the judges to remain in the auditorium because we want to have some nice photos briefly uh, before we continue, okay? So just to note that the, the washrooms are on third floor and on second floor, you're gonna find the refreshments, right? Uh, the tea juice, uh, the pie and everything else uh, that they have to offer there, right? And we'll be back in a few minutes time, just about what, uh, 15 minutes time, 10 or 15 minutes time. So thank you very much.
today. Uh, of course, for those of you that came in late and didn't get to hear uh, my welcome, of course, uh, let, me, let me do that, welcome. All right, uh, this is the fifth annual Research Day 2023. And this year's theme, Mental Health, Reframing the National Perspective. My name is Ken Simmons. Uh, grateful, extremely grateful, always thankful for the opportunity to share my gift and, and my energy and my joy with whoever I'm given an opportunity to do so. So at this time, we are carded to have the eHealth TT presentation showcasing digital strides made in mental health services. All right. Now the presentation will be done by Ms. Keisha Lewis, uh, General Manager of Mental Health Services at the NWRHA. Also, Dr. Samuel Shafi, Medical Director of the St. Anne's Hospital. Also, special presenter, Ms. Camille Chiawai, developer, SME, and equity liaison for the eHealth platform. Okay, and following the presentation, we're gonna move right into the expert panel discussion, and at some point in time, we will give you the opportunity, so once you, you listen attentively, to ask your questions, and you will direct your questions accordingly. I understand, I was informed that microphones are gonna be strategically located in the aisles, so if look at either the left or the right of you, you're gonna see it there, and you know, you'll come to the microphone, say hi, my name is so-and-so, I would like to direct my question to so-and-so, and then ask a question. And, and then we will do our best, well at least they will do their best to make sure that your questions are answered, okay? So this time I would like to hand over to Ms. Keisha Lewis, General Manager of Mental Health Services at NWR Chair. Put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, thank you. I am just introducing our special guest speaker and she will say a little bit about herself and her work with the Northwest region. Camille? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really just an honor to be here this morning to present this journey of digitalization at St. Anne's Hospital and its three wellness centers. I, um, I am originally indeed from Trinidad. I live abroad and um, my goal and, and mantra really is to see whatever I can do to bring the best of, uh, the th of, of the developed world across here into Trinidad in order to augment processes and make life more impactful for all. And so I hope with this journey that I will share with you today, you would see a bit of this impact that we have brought about. So we are going to, what, what is the context of all of this? But we, actually before I should acknowledge and say good morning um, to the chairwoman, Lisa Agard, of the chairman of the board of directors of NWRHA, all members of the NWRHA board of directors, acting CEO, Major Anthony Blake, all invitees, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a tremendous pleasure to be here this morning. And what I would like to share again is this impact of digitalization at St. Anne's Hospital and the three wellness centers. These centers are in Pembroke Street, Digo Martin, as well as Barataria. This really has been a journey of some anticipation, but more importantly, it has been a journey of significantly improved care with the deployment of this e-health platform that I will be showcasing shortly. Why anticipation? Well, the mental health plan of the year 2000 which was led by Dr. Paris Ram, I'm just so honored really, sir, to meet you today, was um, had mentioned so many key points that we hope to have addressed. Two of them primarily being the importance to decentralize, decentralize mental care across Trinidad and Tobago, as well as to destigmatize the negative connotation of mental care. And so we hope that in sharing this digitalization journey with you, we are now on a, a path through NWRHA to advance the ministry's plans in order to really advance mental care to another platform and to shift, shift care in Trinidad and Tobago. So let me now give you some context. At this point in time, we, just bear with me. 
this point in time, all 24 health centers, no, go back please, you're going too fast, right. All 24 health centers of the NWRHA have been digitalized. And these, namely the hospitals, which would be St. Anne's, SJMC, as well as Port of Spain General Hospital. All health centers, as well as wellness centers. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that the e-health platform, which is patient-centric, this has now been deployed and patients are able to benefit from improved care at these platforms. We do have a few of these um, centers that for the need of computers and the appropriate infrastructure, they will then go live, but to a large extent, 95% of all these facilities have been decentralized. And so the benefit of this and the journey is that the patients, we, CEO Agard, Chairman Agard spoke about John, Jane, and James, right? Well, John, James, and James, they can now go across, as long as they're registered, any of these health centers, and when they go there, their records would be automatically pulled up, and their records will give them all the care that they have had from these various health centers, and the consultant that pulls up the record, they see real time, real time the patient information, which ultimately facilitates better patient management at this point of care. So if we shift, so what is the context of this for the for um, St. Anne's and mental wellness, which we want to shift to today? Next slide, please. So when J Jane and John, they go up now to any of the, either St. Anne's or the three wellness centers, Digo Martin, Port of Spain, or Barataria, they're, they're, they're registered already on the system, and one is able to pull up their records very quickly. And upon pulling up their records, they are now receiving significantly improved mental care. The clinician is able to access on tap all of their medical history. And this is very significant because we started this program May of 2021. So it is now two years that these patients have in fact been receiving care. And, and, and as a result, what has been happening is we have significantly improved drug compliance as well as a significant reduction in waste. And this improved drug compliance is actually real. And let me just give you a story. The other day, unfortunately, at one of the health of the wellness centers, the internet was down. But these patients needed to get their medicines. So they were bussed over across to St. Anne's, and there the pharmacists were able just to pull up their names, get all of their records, and give them their medicines. And this was beautiful because they didn't have to miss their medicines. They continued their care and drug compliance, as we said, is, it's just you know, totally um, proceeding with no issues at all. So we have aggregated over these past two years significant data. And we would like to share this with you and s let you see for yourself how the journey of improved care is un has unfolded. So today, if, I'm sorry, could we shift to the next slide? Next slide, please. Good. So as of, we started this program May the 20th of 2021. And, we, and I've decided I'll give you the data up to the March the 31st of this year. The number of patients, unique, unique patients that are registered are 11,594 patients for, that have sought mental care. These patients have been served 69,000 plus times and the amount that has been spent is $20.24 million. Next slide, please. So not to get lost in the numbers, we just, these are three distinct years, if you may, where the patients have been initially registered. So this is the beginning when the, for the first four months of fiscal year 2020 to 2021, 7,200 patients plus were registered. And those that were served were 13,000 in terms of the number of times they were served, the, the unique patients, that showed up were 5,484 that were served 
13,000 times. So we said, let's look now very closely at for the first the six months of 2023. What in fact is the data? Next slide, please. So what we see is that at St. Anne's and the three wellness centers, we've actually registered now new patients, 1,263. These new patients um, were, were, were commingled, if you may, with these 6,830 that were unique, that have been served. And they have been served how many times? 18,000 times. They have been served so far for the first six months, $5.34 million have been spent on these patients. So we said, it'll be curious to see, next slide please. We would be curious to see exactly where. So this is the breakdown by St. Anne's, Barataria, Diggo Martin, and Pembroke Street, exactly what is the activity that took place at each of these centers. Again, remember the data is real time. So here in St. Anne's, you can see the significant volume and throughput that happens here relative to the other wellness centers. They serve a critical role, but still St. Anne's is a key building block, right? So where the, the uniquely served patients during this period was 3,964, but they were served 11,000 times. So, and the amount was 4.2 million. Next slide, please. So what we wanted to go through was to take a look at St. Anne's and do a deeper dive as to their operations and what is it that we are seeing. Next slide. So here we now, on a weekly basis, we see the volume of patients that are registered. It's probably a little bit difficult to see the date, but generally there are spikes at the end of the month. So here, you, the average volume of patients weekly that are being registered are approximately 40 per week, and on a monthly basis, it's 165 so far for these six months the of, of fiscal year 2022 to 2023. So the, we also, what you look at, next slide please, it's the number of patients that were served. So you have a daily volume of 117 patients. This is the volume of prescriptions that are given daily to patients, and it's only St. Anne's, right? So what is this telling you? The St. Anne's Hospital is pretty busy, correct? <laughs> you know, they've seen quite a lot of patients and a lot of care is being given. And you see the volumes in a month, it's clear as well how much is provided per month. Yes. The, the mic? In red, mm -hmm. those unique patients served, those 3,000, almost 4,000 patients, is a representative of new patients. Those are first time persons who are presenting to mental health services who have received a prescription. This data has never before you know, been it available. available. <laughs> in, in, indeed, indeed. So, so in terms of registration, these new registrations, 990 patients so far, to GM Keisha's, Lewis's point, these are the ones that have registered. And unique, unique for the year so far, it's these 3,964 that have showed up for care. So we go in a little bit deeper, and we say, next slide, please. Okay, so we know that how much is spent. So the government is basically spending approximately 24,000 each day on these patients. And we said, okay, next slide. So that this now is said, we said, let's do a little bit deeper dive. Where do they come from? Where do they live? And we can see that this is the heat map of the patients. The majority are from Sawan. You have um, 609 patients that showed up of this 3,000 plus. From Port of Spain, 464 patients. Those are Aruka. Are we not saying anything? Yes. <laughs> this is yes, the evidence. Is so if you live in Sawa, this is a disclaimer. But um, <laughs> right. 
<laughs> this is this is what we see in yes but, but what we, and what is curious as well so it is also too if you look at the country wide location of the patients one sees the extent to which san fernando 24 patients are seen if we go to arima in arima that's 154 patients 114 patients from arima in tobago interestingly three so uh, am I saying anything wrong? <laughs> no, no, it's just sparked communication. People comparing where they live in now. Oh. <laughs> okay, yes, indeed. But it just gives testimony of the countrywide services that SEH is providing as it relates to the path towards mental health, or mental wellness data that has absolutely never been available before. And may I share that in speaking to colleagues in Jamaica, they, they, when, when they learned of this, the response was firecrackers are going off in my head. How is this possible? So Trinidad really, to the point that was raised by Dr. Khan, their lead as it relates to getting you know, the, the data that can be useful ultimately for mental care. So now we said, okay, we know that we have some ideas to where the patients live. Let's talk about, next slide, who are they? So you have a, a, a breakdown, 50 male, 58% female. Bulk of them are registered at St. Anne's, 4%, but we said you have ERHA and CRHA, in some instance, SWRHA, the patient. So, so it's a lesser amount, but let's go deeper. You look, these five medicines, five medicines, predominantly the paripalladon or sustena, that constitutes, plus some other five medicines, cost $3.8 million. That's how much the government has spent. That is 89% of the total cost, okay? Who got this medicines? Remember, we talked about approximately 3,986. Well, for only 463 patients, or 12% of them, which female 219 male, are receiving these top five medicines. So what about these top five medicines? What is unique? Next slide. And this here is really a revolutionary care. I, I, I can speak just demographically, but I want to go to the panel for them to comment on this. You would notice $3.7 million, or 85% of costs, only serve 6% of the patients that present. You get that, guys? $3.7 million, which is 85% of the total cost during this period, only serve 257 patients, or 6%. Why? What is unique about this medicine? Well, the, look at the demographics. What we did is we decided to explore a bit more about these 257 patients. You would notice that really, from the age of the, the male, female, and then male predominant, and something happens after 51. They drop off. And it's the women who continue to get, the, the get these drugs, because we were discussing this why. Why is this the fact? But I, I believe I would, it, 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 I must not comment. Dr. Shafi and Dr. Tello, they need to comment a bit more on this slide, please. Okay, so um, in terms of moving forward with mental health services, and the focus has been not to talk about mental illness, to talk about mental wellness. And I know one of our future speakers did talk about stigma and discrimination. And if you have a recollection about how we used to view mental, mentally ill people 20, 30 years back, uh, individuals who walk around stiff, and drooling from the mouth, falling down, things like that. And that was what informed the introduction of this medication uh, into the system to partly deal with, number one, the stigma issues in terms of the side effect of the medications that we're accustomed to using, especially the first generation antipsychotics. That's number one. Number two, we had to deal with issue of functionality and when we made proposal for this medication to, to be used in the system, we look at that, the group, the same group, 18 to 50, functionality. That is, you can continue to take your medication and be able to go to work. 
and be able to stay home and be able to maybe take care of your family, take care of your children. And then the other thing in terms of the goal as well is to reduce readmission rate because if we are talking decentralization and we are talking about reducing the number of patients within the hospital system, we want to introduce a new weapon that can give, give us the opportunity to be able to do that. And that is what our medication is doing. And if you see, with this data, we are able to re recognize that we were actually able to achieve the purpose for, the, for what this medication was actually, um, what we applied to use medication to do in the first instance. So we've been able to get there. And um, so we're getting there, and as for the group that drop out, I think that might be more or less male and female factors in terms of how we treat with mental health. Um, in, in terms of comparing males and females, their attitude to mental health problems as they grow older. Mm -hmm. Dr. Okay. Tello. Uh, Minister, and um, I think it was Dr. Khan both spoke about the importance of treating physical health and mental health with the same level of priority. When paliperidone was added to the national formulary, it was, as Dr. Shafi mentioned, with a specific goal. So that there's a reason why you see a particular age uh, dis descriptive. And that's because when we have to add a new drug to the formulary and it's an expensive drug, we have to justify it. Or the government is not just going to spend that money without a good reason. And I was the one who actually had to go to the National Drug Formulary Committee meeting and advocate for this drug. And, you know, people was, you know, questioning why are you going to spend so much money on one psychiatric drug? You know, that 6% number could get people worried. Why are we spending so much on so few? Right. But that so few speaks to people who can be working and earning and paying tax. And that's what I said to the committee. Are we going to have people in their 30s and 40s on disability allowance when they can work and pay taxes and contribute to society, right? And when we look at it in terms of the larger scale of health economics, when we think about what we spend on antihypertensives or oral hypoglycemics, what we spend on chemotherapy, what we spend on MRI machines and surgical procedures and everything else, that is a drop in the bucket. And to talk about the drop in the bucket, <laughs> the dollar value is That's $2, right. $2,373 per month per, per patient. And each, if, if each of those patients is working yes. and contributing, we have gotten that money back several times over. Correct. So it's very, very important as we move forward. <laughs> It's very important that we move forward, that we really focus on further um, improvements in our pharmacotherapy options. There are new medications on the market that treat with some of those horrible side effects that Dr. Shafi, Shafi mentioned, that, that have the potential to reverse some of those side effects if you catch it early enough. None of them are on the national formulary as yet, so there's a lot of work still for us to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we actually also too wanted, next slide please, to say, because we wanted to see, you know, the evidence is there. So let's share it with you. Where do they live? These patients, so not, you know, we're from which areas? Again, we see Port of Spain, Sawa, Tunapuna, right? It's, it's a bit high. Interestingly, um, we, Arima, 16 of these patients get this, this treatment. And where is Tobago? So no one from Tobago is getting this treatment. Maybe something is good with the going and soaking those Tobago waters and taking life a little bit easier. Yeah. So, so, so next. Um, let me just correct yes. that. Yes. Um, sentence was actually approved as this, the central point for the distribution of um, sustainer to the whole country. And one of the reasons, it was part of the things we had to agree to for government to actually purchase the medication because of the cost. So we basically manage it from St. Anne's Hospital. So we do have people in Tobago who are, who are unsustainable. Correct, got it. So if we go to the next slide, what we also said, okay, we understand what are the most costly, but what about, this is interesting, right? What about the top 10 dispensed medicines? What do they cost? $165,000. Yeah. 
This is 4% of the total cost and they're given to 61% of patients or 2,425. So really the, what we have done with Sustena in order to ensure the ongoing financial independence of these individuals, it's really a blessing that what Trinidad and Tobago is doing for their, for their citizens. So, um, because I tell you, I'm in the other islands and for everybody, if you don't pay, you don't get the care. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> Right. So but but have, Camille, yes, just to interject, yes. there is, I mean, this slide is saying so much more. So much, yes. Because if we look at the top dispensed drug, Dr. Otello, which is a mood stabilizer, mm -hmm. that, that gives us an indication now about diagnosis and the prevalence of what types of disorders persons are suffering from in the country, um, which is not information we would have had before. So that's very interesting that the first, you know, the most frequently prescribed drug is a mood stabilizer followed by an antipsychotic. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it's about moods, right? Mood, moods and mood swings and so on. Yeah. And then the other thing you might see metformin there is like, what is metformin doing there? So what happened over the years, we realized most of our patients, in addition to mental health uh, challenges, do also have NCDs. NCDs. Yeah. And to make life easy for them, many of them are on disability or public assistance. So rather than going to two, three, four, five clinics. So if we can manage your diabetes hypertension in our clinic, we will manage it in the clinic. So that's how we end up with many of these medications within our clinic system. Mm -hmm. And we will show you on that. Next slide, please. So th this here gives the distribution of the individuals. So we can see even um, this age group, right? The, the, between 19 to 50, look at the frequency with which they present themselves in order to get medicines for you know, ultimately to function and to be in a state of wellness, if you may, despite the challenges that, that they may have. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna shift. I'm gonna shift the discussion because one of the things that, this, that we have also been able to achieve is a significant reduction in drug wastage. And this is very big. So why? Why are we able to do this? Because there's a very acute management of the drugs where the pharmacist is almost like, it's a, it has to be a game, right? Why? Because we want to make sure that whatever is going to expire over the next two months, they have to be consumed. They will not expire. Next slide. And the results of this are just simply incredible. This basically reveals what? As of September the 1st, 2022, we have not had one drug at St. Anne's in an expired suit. That is a real and, achievement. And, and this is a game changer because when, four years ago, I went and I introduced myself to Dr. Othello and we'd explained what we were doing at St. Anne's, they were, she said, this is fantastic. I really would like us to get this because admittedly, we just discovered we had approximately three million of drugs on property. We didn't know we had it, and you know what? When they looked into it, all of the drugs were in an expired state. And so those days are gone. So this, as they say, whatever is saved is money earned. And so I would say, you know, this is just a significant game changer as it relates to the care. And to take this game changing further, next slide. Next slide, please. Right, this here, the system, the, having a system, it's very much um, some in intelligence, if you may, as it relates to the top, what are all the drugs, the top, the, the consumption of every single drug. So you're able to look at the consumption rates of drugs, and based on that, you're able to know how much you have in inventory, you know how much you have in inventory, what is the demand going to be for the month, therefore do you have a surplus of drugs or are you gonna have a shortage? And so your ordering is a lot more real time in order to minimize an issue of getting, get, getting you know, not having drugs. Furthermore, to the extent drugs are required by other either RHAs or other um, health centers, it is very easy in order to transfer these drugs across. And, and this now, next slide please, to Dr. Shafi's point. I thought when I saw this slide and then I understood it, again, 
the what care the Ministry of Health has given to the population, it cannot take this for granted. This red shows the amount of psychotic drugs. The gray shows the number of drugs for NCDs, chronic ailments. And then other is this. So that because the patients are, you know, are, are basically a bit uh, challenged, look at the number of them that receive care for um, the just tremendous amount, males and females, go to this one stop of St. Anne's Hospital to get their drugs for mental wellness as well as to address their NCDs. Again, unique, totally unique in the Caribbean. Thank you. It's like a quick shop, one-stop shop, yes. right? So yes. we're not sending you to a health center to get your antihypertensive. If you're on a psychiatric drug, you get your other NCDs medication there. Correct. What we aim to do is reciprocate that process in primary care. Yes, correct. And then, next slide, please. So something wonderful happened three weeks ago. What happened three weeks ago is we de implemented phase two of the program. And phase two was that when a patient now shows up, the clinicians can now access the patient's at records and then can better assess them for admission and discharge. And I really have to share this story because it happened. So here it is now we are talking about, here it is we are talking to the nurses to express what this new platform that is going to be launched, right, phase two. And so I said to them, you, you now are going to be handling the ad admissions of the, of the patients, you're going to be assessing them uh, for their care and their state. So I said, you see that big book that you have where you write the patient's name? Could you please pick any name on that book? Let's just pick a name, John Doe. John Doe, I said, I want you to enter John Doe's name into now the, the platform. This is your platform, enter it. When I entered the name John Doe, what came out, she screamed in <laughs> delight because she said, oh my God, I cannot believe it because she then saw two years of patient, uh, patient records on John Doe. So now the nurses, all clinicians have context of each of these patients. They are just not a, somebody who's just appearing. They have the context and so they can give them better care because they now see over two years, here's the medicines they, they are getting there in front of them and they can do a more detailed assessment of the patients. So this is, and to Keisha's point, I think Keisha, you wanted to make a couple of comments too with what you see coming forth with this. Uh, no, I mean, Camille, this is exceptional. We are now electronically registering patients at a 100-year-old St. Anne's Hospital, Chairman. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, we have been hearing about this for years and years. And, and, you know, you will have an opportunity to ask us questions. It has not been an easy process. Um, but when a patient now comes to St. Anne's Hospital, if you are not already in the system, you are now registered on the system. So it's a one registration process. And we have not had enough time to create a dashboard from that. But if you could just imagine the amount of data this is going to tell us. I, I, you know, and, and the research implications for that. This is going to tell us where you came from, who referred you, your age group, your presenting complaint. We have flagged suicide. Um, so we really look forward to the next stage, which is, the, which is the report building stage. And we will gladly collaborate with Dr. Khan on this further because we, it, indeed, the, the wealth of information that is unique to Trinidad, where we have all these different yes. ethnic backgrounds and so many different issues and religions, what have you, it, it, now it, it, there was, we will start to get some, you know, put some meat on the bones, if you may, as opposed to speaking in our superlatives. But Dr. Khan, you may want to say something. I, I just want to say, I mean, it, it's, it's so exciting. It is, and, and I made a note here. Yes. And I really must commend the NWRHA that you all are not just reframing the national perspective, you are revolutionizing it. What we are seeing here is going to have tangible impacts on so many levels. Yes. Data is gold. Yes. <laughs> and you are now providing the information that everybody could use. The service providers, everybody, researchers, right. and policy users. So it's, right. it's really exciting. I had to, I had to express that.
So, um, so now we just go, we wanted to show um, the viewers, please, just for little clips. Um, uh, next slide, next slide. Right, so we wanted, that, that we actually spoke to end users to just get a little overview in terms of what is their experience with using this platform. As you recall, we talked about having started in St. James, and now um, we are at NWR at, at SGMC, but also all the health centers across um, NWRHA. And so, it, don't take it from me, but we want to really, you hear it directly from those that are using the system. So please, could you start those video clips? Uh, with some volume, please. Firstly, at the strategic end, we have the office of the chief executive office that gives us a couple of examples. Digitization allows us to be data driven. Data means that you have information at your hands that allows you to bring strategic inputs at critical time. I'll give you some examples of that. Our e platform now helps us, our health information system now helps us to track uh, the utilization of pharmaceuticals across the United States and other countries. It allows us to see shortages in particular health centers or health institutions, and it allows us to move stock from one institution to the next in a quick and efficient manner. It also allows us to see expiring dates of stock, so there's less usage in the system. It allows us to see which drugs are uh, their extremely high utilization of, so it also helps us in terms of ordering uh, pharmaceuticals and so on. One day of training, another full day, uh, a couple of hours, I would say, uh, in some cases with some yoga consultants, we may have a repeat session. Initially, the main issue was that, of course, some of the yoga consultants may not have been as uh, proficient at typing. But within a fairly short space of time, I would say after the first month of usage, they were, I'm talking about consultants, over six day, they were only able to use the system So there's a learning curve initially, and after the first week, I think everyone saw the benefits. I don't think we could go back to that paper process. Um, to be honest, um, I love, love, love my system. Well, the system on the whole. All right, it's quick. It's easier, the transition is very smooth. It takes away that having this bulky file, having to flip through, you know, if you are able to assess the patient information faster, all right? So I, I don't think we could go back to that paper trail. We provide outpatient services beyond the boundaries of the Northwest region. So the Eastern region and the North Central region as well. To be able to connectivity amongst different sites and the outpatient clinic, we hope in the future that this system could be expanded to that, to obviously allow for the better prescription management and medication management across sites. This will be especially useful for St. Anne's Hospital as well, because we admit patients from not only across Trinidad, but Tobago as well. So we look forward to the expansion of the HIS system across the whole country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Camille, for your presentation. I thought you were gonna stay. But <laughs> um, we could perhaps entertain a couple of questions if anybody has any questions specifically related to the presentation, um, to the data collection process and the digitalization process. There are two. Um, you give him a mic, Professor Prof. Prof Ali. 
Okay. They have two mics. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay, most of this patient, thanks uh, for the question of um, Professor Ali, most of these patients will more or less have told us uh, uh, which doctor, what clinic, uh, where these medications are prescribed. So we more or less from time to time, we only manage individuals who are stable. So if you need additional input from somebody who specializes in diabetes, we will send you back to your clinic. So for stable patients who do not need to continue to um, go to their doctor, we manage them at our clinic. Just give you an example where we talk about the MHGAP program, we are seeing that the primary care physicians should manage minor conditions like um, anxiety, depression, that are manageable. However, when these individuals, when their symptoms become very severe, it is expected that these individuals will make the appropriate referral to people who specialize in managing these conditions. Well, that's what the platform, like what the platform that is being introduced now, which we just discussed, that is going to address and solve that problem. Because basically, the other doctor who is seeing the patient on the other side, when they go on the platform, they'll be able to see what is happening. That this individual is getting medication from another clinic. So there'll be, there'll be connectivity in that regard. If I could just elaborate, if I could just elaborate, because the question is very well taken. Indeed, we spoke about, we started at St. James Medical Complex Cancer, and that was where we did a lot of work, and we can certainly meet you to show you what has been achieved. But this was so very important that when we, in fact, launched St. Anne's, we spent quite a lot of time going through to say, when a patient is receiving certain drugs that are psychotic, if they're also receiving certain cancer drugs, immediately there's a pop-up that talks about drug interaction. So we have taken this extremely deep to facilitate the entire integration. And that's why I show that first slide where we talk about all the, the uh, hospitals as well as health centers, they have been integrated. Because to Dr. Shafi's point, you show up at one of these health centers and all of them will see your profile. And that also too has enabled the doctor to even call. So let's say it's a patient who is in a car accident and you're able to pull up their information because that's our forward vision, right? In an ambulance, you pull up a patient and you get their profile. Immediately, you will be able to talk to the doctors to talk further about their care. The integration is here at NWRHE. Thank you. Thank you. I think the communication, uh, it's on. can you hear me? We're hearing you. Yeah, the communication, instant communication is also important as well as the telecommunication, uh, uh, e electronic communication that you're talking about from the records. Uh, the other good thing about the platform is um, it, you're kind of like alerted about drug-drug interaction. Please take note of that as well. That's why the platform is very, very good in terms of if you're prescribing something that 
is going to interact with other medication the patient is on, you're going to be alerted right away about that medication. By the way, we were showing this drug interaction feature to a pharmacist at one of the leading private sector hospitals, and when they saw it pop up, they were, whoa, really? Because again, we have to go deep. We cannot stay superficial. Okay, so my question is about patient-centered care. So we're offering um, interaction for physicians. However, patients would like to know of their care and have access to the health information system. Is there an opportunity for patients to have that care? And what uh, also is the opportunity for integrating this system with other health information systems that exist? Thank you very much for the question. Absolutely, so we talked about patient-centric. What we have in fact cre uh, created is the eHealth TT app. So patients download the eHealth TT app, they will get a quick 360 degree profile of their situation, they will see what medicines they're on, they're able to see what their prescriptions, they're able to see when are their appointments in the past that they had and what is in the future. And we're also even taking this to another level. We just have to get the capacity from the hospitals to, pre to book appointments for themselves. So Digo Martin is, in fact, they have, because you've got to work with facilities that have extra capacity. So Digo Martin and Aranguez, they have this capacity. So that is coming, absolutely coming, yes. It's, we think it's critical because at the end of the day, it is centric to the patient. I, I believe I, did I, I answered your question, yes? Okay. Thanks, Camille. So let me introduce to you the rest of the panel members. Well, you've met Dr. Katija Khan. Dr. Hazel Tello is our Director of Mental Health Services and Substance Use Misorders at the Ministry of Health. Dr. Samuel Shafi is the Medical Director at the St. Anne's Hospital. Dr. Harris is the WHO PAHO Regional Advisor on Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health for the region. For Trinidad, for us. <laughs> and Tobago, yes, of course. <laughs> and Camille. And I am Keisha Lewis. I'm the General Manager of Mental Health Services. So we're going to have a 15 minutes discussion, um, guys, and then we will take questions after. Following the presentation, we want to have a discussion on, you know, how data can drive the decentralization process in the country. Now, before I start, I want to recognize our staff who deliver mental health services at a certain hospital, right? Um, we know that there are huge challenges. We acknowledge that. There are operational challenges, infrastructural challenges, sometimes clinical challenges. But we want to use this 15, 20 minutes to engage and learn from the experts we have here who have varying degrees of experience so that we have a productive discussion. Um, you know, let's start with Dr. Harris, seeing that you WHO, <laughs> right? Um, you know, we have heard that mental health disorders are highly prevalent. Um, they contribute a significant percentage um, to mortality and disability. Um, what is driving transformation in the way mental health services are being delivered, both internationally, regionally, and locally? And you can all feel free to chip in, okay? Thank you so very much for your question. And it is important, and I w would like to add my commendations and say, I too am impressed with what we have seen here today. Now, as we have been saying, and we, we mentioned several times since this morning, mental health um, disorders, mental health substance use disorders, uh, come for a significant portion, 14% of the burden of health, and the, the, bur the burden of disease, the global burden of disease. So it's not something that can be ignored, yes? And so um, more and more, we, we saw in the period of the pandemic, the, the importance that, he, that came to the fore. And we at the Pan American Health Organization, we are a part, we are one of six regional um, health groups of the World Health Organization. So we have evidence 
not just from the region of the Americas, but from other regions that have gone ahead, that have already begun to do the work of decent decentralization, deinstitutionalization. There are things like um, the rights approach that we have seen. Uh, we, m many of us in our training, when we look at the pictures of what we see of, of large institutions, it's horrific what we have seen. And other regions have gone ahead and have made those changes. And so we, we, we have the benefit of shared information, you know, using the evidence that has gone before. And so in, in light of all of that, it's, it's, it's only fitting that we, we do what is right for, for, for the population. We spoke to the fact, um, we, we spoke of the fact, is there really a, uh, any barrier or any this delineation between physical and mental health? So if we're working to improve health for everybody, we, we must also include um, mental health, yes? So that's driving driving the, the need for the changes. A lot has been said since this morning, you know, the need to, um, to strengthen the community-based services, the need to treat persons closer to where they are, you know, so that when, the, when, when it's time for them to, to return back, they are able to get the, the support of the family, the social services that are around them, and so that they can be more easily reintegrated into society and not locked away for extended periods of time. So there's a lot of evidence that is driving it. There, there are others who have gone before, and it just makes good sense to treat our people well. And even if you think about the, the expense for the persons who are getting the more expensive medications, you invest in them because they can return and be productive members of society. So we have the evidence and we, we encourage that that is done. Um, Dr. Shafe, my next question is directed towards you. You know, the deinstitutionalization process has been stalled for a number of years at St. Anne's Hospital. And we mustn't shy away from the fact that, yes, we do have a lot of persons who are chronic, who live at the hospital, who possibly could live somewhere other than in a hospital. Um, give us a brief overview of what we do at St. Anne's Hospital. What are the services available? Okay, thank you for the question again. Um, the services we provide at St. Anne's Hospital is not just restricted to prescribing medication. We also have other allied therapies like occupational therapy, art therapy, music therapy, physical therapy. Um, those services are there and some of them in the recent time we try to also extend them into the community, into the wellness centers. Uh, we've had our challenges, those challenges are there, but we're more or less moving forward one step at a time in terms of, I know the CEO talk about Arima Rehab and the day hospital. In addition to that, the board and the CEO, they've been working with us to actually improve the allied services. That is, in the recent time, the front hall is currently being repaired, which is where our patients used to work and used to uh, do more or less uh, social engagement. And then we also have the improvement that's taking place with the reorganization of the allied services. In addition to that, St. Anne's Hospital, we provide service, or I would say Northwest, to almost every part of Trinidad. Um, from, not, from Northwest, North Central to Eastern. South has been able to, they've been able to develop their services, but they still depend on us, because they only have like 20 beds in San Fernando. So anything beyond that, they come back to us. The same thing with, with uh, Arim, um, Tobago. So St. Anne's has continued to be and the main support for mental health services in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. And Camille, hearing that, you know, a background of what is driving the delivery of mental health services internationally and locally, and what we offer at St. Anne's Hospital, how, how did this process come about? I mean, what is the context in terms of mental health? Why invest in, in, in the system for the hospital? Thank you, thank you for that question. Um, well, really, the, the, 
I would say the root of all of this is, um, it, it has been just an appreciation in the United States with uh, Obamacare of how inefficient so many processes were and the importance of de deploying um, digitized systems, electronic health record systems to improve this care. So that um, being successful in achieving that was really a key building block to advance elsewhere. And um, I remember actually that I was at a conference the World Bank Congress of Toronto, and organized in 2019, March 2019, this conference on, men, on care, health care. You had participants from as far as Mongolia, you had from Nigeria, South, um, New Zealand, really all over the world. Nobody was from Trinidad, unfortunately, but all over the world, right? And, um, and so, the, it was great, these, these different presentations. And at the end of the presentation, there was a, a he's basically a director of strategy of, of mental or healthcare, of healthcare at the World Bank. And these were his words. I have come here for the past two and a half days. I have listened to you all. You talked about AI, you talked about PPP in terms of public-private partnerships, you spoke about fantastic technologies that could be deployed, but you know what? No one, no one spoke about mental care. Now this was globally. And that is when I realized, oh, okay, this is something that needs acute attention. And it just coincided that, you know, we were doing work at St. James Medical Complex. And I made it a point that as soon as that was launched, that I then immediately meet with Dr. Tello and Dr. And, and GM Lewis for us to start the discussion on the journey. That, that's the catalyst. Thank you, Camille. Now, it's only fair we ask you some questions now. Um, Dr. Tello, to be honest, we have been hearing about decentralization for all my life. Um, you know, thank you. And <laughs> where, you know, perhaps start by, you know, what is decentralization? And where are we? What is the strategy? What's happening? Uh, all of that is one question. One question. That's a whole big question. <laughs> but thank you, Keisha. Yeah, I have also been hearing about decentralization for a long time. I mean, from medical school, from the time you started in postgrad mental health, and you learn all the lessons about who did it well and who did it badly, and patients ending up in prisons, and patients ending up homeless, and all those sorts of things. I'm also aware of the work that was done well before me um, from 1975 when an early attempts were made to decentralize mental health services in Trinidad and Tobago, and Dr. Paris Ram could talk a lot more about that. So that's how we came to have the community clinics that we have today, as well as the extended care centers that were originally in, uh, I think, four regions, but now we only have um, two left, one of which has been repurposed. But yeah, it, from I was earlier I was saying to someone when somebody asked me what's the difference between working at St. Anne's and working in my current post, I was saying, you know, when I was at St. Anne's, it was easy to sit in the seat of consultant and later medical director and complain about all the things that you weren't seeing happening. Ministry ain't doing nothing. We do have this, we do have that, nothing ain't happening. And now you get to sit in the seat. <laughs> of the person who's responsible for getting it moving. So that was another transition. But on this side of the fence, unfortunately, you're aware of the challenges and the limitations and the resource, you know, those things. But those things don't stop us. We, when I went to the ministry, that was when the policy had just been approved, the, the new mental health policy, 2019 to 2029, but it was approved in September of 2019. I went to the ministry in November of 2019, and we all know what happened very early in 2020, okay? The team in the mental health unit had already developed an implementation plan for the, for the policy, and one of the early things we were going to do was a study tour in collaboration with PAHO to look at models of decentralization in some Latin American territories. And we chose those territories because we chose places with similar economic 
and social structures to what we have. So no point going to look at what it have in England. That's not helping us, right? I mean, come on. We do have the resources they have. So we were just about to do that when the first COVID-19 case was diagnosed in one of the places we were going to, and that was the end of that. But we continued to work in the background even while the focus was on mounting a robust mental health response to the pandemic, because that was the main thing we had to do for about two years. But in the background, we continue working on um, plans towards decentralization so that we're at the point now where the paperwork part of things are done, right? We know what is ahead of us in terms of what we need to do. We know we have a better sense of what resources are required. And we're at the point where the plans that my department have developed are now about to be submitted to the executive of the Ministry of Health for approval, and of course, only when the executive and the ministry approve them do they go further in terms of the things that would require cabinet approval and so on. So it's not that we've been sitting doing nothing. <laughs> we have been working very, very hard. And um, in terms of what you're going to see down the road, you know, a lot of the things that were said here today highlighted the need for decentralization in, for, in a true sense, not the partial version of it that we've done so far. But for instance, we spoke about the mental health patient who is diabetic getting their diabetic medication in the mental health clinic. Similarly, the hypertensive patient who is anxious should get treated for their anxiety in general practice. And that's why we're talking about image gap training. Right? You shouldn't have to leave general practice and go find a psychiatric clinic in a different health center to get an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety drug prescribed or to see a therapist. So those are the things we would like to see happening in the community. We start, we, we, we're doing it in layers. The, of course, the most basic layer of mental health care is what we provide to each other when we support each other. But then there's the layer above that where Primary care has an important role, and we're working on that through the MH GAP training. And just in, in May, we're about to start a new round of MH GAP training. We're actually training new trainers so that after PAHO has done that and returned to the you know, people who are trainers for that program, are, have returned to their offices, we here in Trinidad and Tobago will continue to train other people. Because what happened? We trained people years ago. And then there was attrition. That's what normally happens if you don't have a proper rollout plan. And that's why Dr. Khan spoke about the evaluation she did, which pre presented us with a better way forward in terms of how we could make it more sustainable so that over time, treating basic, basic mental health disorders in primary care will be the norm and people will be referred up the system as needed in the same way that it is done for any other disorder. So we, we also want to see people be able to access rehabilitative care in the community. In other words, as soon as it is feasible and practical to discharge somebody from hospital, we want to be able to discharge them, but we want to know that all the services they need in order to complete their recovery and maintain that recovery are available in the communities. So that's what we're working towards. Um, minister did say it was, it's going to be a journey, but we hope that it's not going to be too long a journey. We hope we're going to achieve some very, very practical um, things in the relatively near future. Thank you. And I remember you explaining it to me once that decentralization is not just about closing down the psychiatric hospital. That's right. It's not about discharging patients. It's not about reducing hospital in, for beds. The strategy being used is? A layered approach of starting with strengthening the community services. If we do not strengthen community services, people leave the hospital and they get lost in the system. If there is nobody to help you to make sure that you remain on your medication, you end up back in hospital. We want to get rid of that revolving door. When we talk about decentralization, we talk about two things to make it simple closing the entry door to that custodial type of care and opening wide the exit door. 
In other words, we want, to, we want to stop people from having to come into hospital and stay for long periods. In fact, if you can be treated in your community and never be admitted to hospital, that is the ideal scenario. So the more we can treat you in the community, the better it is. And for those who need to be admitted to hospital, we want to be able to treat you right in your community. That's why Minister spoke about a, um, psychiatric beds in the new hospitals. Arima, point 14, when the San Grandi Hospital is opened, and of course, right in Northwest, the central block of Port of Spain General Hospital. I don't have to, I'm not gonna start about the pain that I felt when Wadi died. I'm not gonna go there today. But it was the, the, the psychiatric ward at Port of Spain Hospital years ago, right? I, I, Dr. I know Dr. Paris Ram shared that pain, but uh, we look forward to an, a new psychiatric ward in the Port of Spain Hospital Central Block. And basically, if you need admission, you should have it close to where you live, and that should be followed up with outpatient services. And for those who need a different, a, a more tertiary level care, yes, it will be available, but again, we want to return people to the community after they've received care. In the, in the world that I envision, the only people who should have to be receiving long-term custodial care should be those whose symptoms pose a significant risk to the safety of others. And we all know that that's a very small percentage of the patients. We also know that the therapeutic options available to them today are much better than what was available to them 20, 30, 40 years ago. So people may have stayed in the system for 20 years because they were dangerous when they first got there. That shouldn't be happening now because if they get proper care, many of them, even though they may have come in through the court system at a time when their behavior was dangerous, as they receive the rehabilitative care that they need, we should be able to return most of them to the community. Yeah. Thank you, and as you say, return most of them to the community. Dr. Khan, with your um, allied therapy hat on, what, what are some of the you know, challenges, or what should we consider when we're talking about integration of um, you know, mental health into primary care with regards to the provision of allied therapy? Okay, so just to, to make sure we're all on the same page, so when we talk about all these allied therapies, it's all these other non-pharmacological interventions that have been proven to be beneficial and, and can facilitate recovery. So we're talking about everything from psychological interventions, therapy, behavior interventions, but then we're also talking about things like music therapy, and we have a poster from um, uh, Jamal Glenn, the music therapist at, at uh, St. Anne's here, we're talking about art therapy, we're talking about all these other interventions, um, occupational therapy that can be made uh, available. So I think it's recognizing when we conceive of care, that that care has to incorporate all of these. Now, my colleagues have heard me <laughs> speak on numerous occasions about the dominance of the medical model uh, and how it still prevails to a certain extent. And what do I mean by that, where we just conceive of illness in terms of a disease aspect. So we only, we're only concerned with what medicines do we need to, to involve, rather than a biopsychosocial model where we recognize that there are all these other factors, behavioral and social factors, that impact everything from uh, whether you manifest the illness to how it's managed and, and how you recover. So definitely taking that framework. And Keisha, if I may be so bold, I jotted down a note about this issue of decentralization, deinstitutionalization. And I just wanted to mention just one point on the implications for that for patients and their autonomy, their agency, their dignity. Yes. So I, something? Oh. I, I agree with you. You know, when we, um, you know, the, the WHO has a different side to what decentralization is. And when we teach about decentralization, one of the definitions we use is that decentralization is the, about the empowerment of a person with a mental disorder to lead a life towards social inclusion. Now, this is not about the reorganization of services, the infrastructure, the finance, etc. This that is about side. the way yeah. the person yeah, the person-centered approach, the way in which the person takes control of their illness. And, and I wanna just make a point that shows how these things tie in together. So when we talk about theory, research, and practice, that triangle, 
and how it's important to have all those components feeding into each other. So when I teach about, I teach modules on ethics and, and professional practice, and we talk about the philosophy of ethics. So most medical doctors would have taken a, the Hippocratic Oath when they, they graduate, and that is based off a paternalistic model. And that was a traditional way of viewing medicine. A paternalistic model, father knows best, doctor knows best. So don't worry, just trust me or trust the doctors to know what's best for us. They will tell you what to do, etc. And for a while that was the prevailing model, but it's since moved on to other philosophies that embrace values of autonomy, reciprocity, that acknowledge the role of the patient as a stakeholder and a partner in that decision making. So when you have something like this e-health platform and you have an app, uh, Every, every practitioner in here has had the experience where you ask a patient about, well, what medication are you on? And they'd be like, well, I take, a, I take a tablet, I have a white tablet in the morning, and then I take a pink one in the evening, and, and they don't know what it, they don't know the name, and then they said, well, what were you diagnosed with? Um, well, I think, I think it might be pressure. The, yeah? Yes. And, and so yes. usually, and now we, we just kind of work with it. So, so they kind of leave what they figure that specialized knowledge up to the doctor. But with something like this platform, where they have access to their own records. Also, sometimes I see patients and they're meticulous. They come with a folder and they have copies of everything, all their reports, all their scans, everything. And then you have others who come who are a little bit more disorganized and they're like, well, doc, I don't know what prescription I might have to, when I go home, I'll, I'll see you, I'll Thank call you. and I'll get I'm the name. So, so just to wrap up, it's to say that you know, this has the power to empower patients to be in charge of their own health. If they forget, they could just check the app and see what medication they're on. Also, we had done a study a few years ago with one of my graduate students in clinical psychology program. We we're looking at factors that affect attendance at clinics. And one, we couldn't access a lot of data because there wasn't mm -hmm. a lot. But the one clinic we were, we found that patients with schizophrenia were among the groups that had highest absenteeism. And we couldn't, what we wanted to do was delve more into why. But also with this app, it also presents the potential to send appointment reminders. Yes, yes. Yeah? And through that same plan, no additional cost, no additional infrastructure, it's there. So lots of great potential. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we can entertain one question, he said. <laughs> Of course. Maybe we can put the lights back on. My name is Anthony Davis. This morning, we discussed the term mental health, and we said we wanted to change it to mental wellness. To me, the problem is not the word health or wellness. The problem is the word mental. Every time we say the word mental to people, people think people have psychiatric problems, and that is the connotation where I'm concerned. Dr. Otello spoke about patients being treated for physical problems, getting medication there, and also can get the medication for psychiatric problems. Why can't we change it to a wellness clinic instead of a physical wellness or mental wellness or mental health? I think the word mental is the problem that we need to get rid of. Thank you. Thank you for that question slash comment. And uh, we're pretty proud that we've actually begun to do that. The new wellness centers are actually called behavioral health and wellness centers. And that was done in a very purposeful way so that people know that the focus is on your wellness and since the brain affects how we think how we behave and everything else we chose a less stigma ridden name for those outpatient facilities and we hope that over time more clinics would get would, would follow that model more outpatient services for mental health would follow that model thank you Thank you for your questions. Thank you for the panel. I will just end by saying that the Northwest region continues to lead the way in which we want mental health services to be delivered. 
We have the data now, Camille, our research in mental health can now be more defined because our data is now readily available. Okay, thank you. Let's hear it one more time for the members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. Very, very much informative. And I hope we have learned um, a lot, as I mentioned earlier on, that we will take with us uh, forever. So we want to move right along. Uh, we are slightly uh, off of the time schedule, but of course, uh, we will forge ahead and we're going to be um, uh, encouraging you uh, one more time, of course, to scan your QR code. And we want you to vote for the, the People's Choice Poster Choice Prize. So if you have not done that as yet, take out your phone and, and scan the QR code and go on there to vote. Okay, so voting will close in a short while. So let me remind you, if you have not done that as yet, the badge that you, that you have in your possession, scan the QR code and you can vote for your choice there as well. Also, don't forget to, to fill out the feedback form. And also, for those of you that have further questions, you can submit your questions to health.services.gov.tt, okay? At gov.tt. So again, for those of you who have questions, you can field your questions at healthservices at gov.tt, all right? All right, so we move right along uh, very quickly. We have the oral presentations and poster judging, which will be done simultaneously. So what we're gonna do, of course, let me make mention of the, the, the judges of the poster presentation. Let me make, acknowledge them. Now we were asking the researchers that you could, if you could make your way to uh, the whole area to stand by your poster because we're going to have the judges go out there to, to judge, and we, we're going to be doing the oral presentation simultaneously. So let me make mention of those who are charged with the responsibility for adjudicating the poster um, presentation, okay? So we have Mrs. Shuma Alexander Campbell, General Manager of Nursing and member of the NWRA Chair Research Ethics Committee. That's one of the judges. Dr. Aruna Singh, primary care physician two and member of the NWRHA Research Ethics Committee. Also another judge, Dr. Susan Chand, director of research and innovation at the University of the Southern Caribbean. Another judge, Dr. Samantha Glasgow from the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Professor Patrick Alpaca, I hope I got that correct, from the University of the West Indies. Dr. Satish Janki from the University of the West Indies. So ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for all the adjudicators, the judges for the poster presentation. So as, as I mentioned, it's gonna be done simultaneously so uh, you would have seen people, you know, got up, the, res the researchers, they got up, and they were, they're going to be standing uh, by their posters, and the judges are going to be there judging accordingly. Also, we're going to be having those uh, doing their oral presentation today. And first, let me mention the judges. Dr. Leslie Roberts, Deputy Chairman of the Board of Directors of NWRHAs, Dr. Karen Peer from the University of the West Indies of Trinidad and Tobago. Professor Bidyadwa, sir, if I get that correct, from the University of the West Indies. Professor Chidam Izenwaka. Did I get that correct? I hope I did, all right. From the University of the West Indies and also Dr. Oscar Ocho from the University of the West Indies. Put your hands together for those judges, ladies and gentlemen. So right, so let me, let me give you the criteria for those who are presenting orally. So you will have a maximum time of eight minutes or less, 
All right, if you can do it in less than eight minutes, that'll be very much appreciated. And you will come and make your presentations, and of course, uh, the judges will judge accordingly those names that I mentioned just a short while ago. So first and foremost, let me call to the stage researcher Troy Smith, uh, Facebook addiction user risk profiles. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, so Keegan, sorry, researcher Keegan Kumar, right? Uh, completion rates and patient characteristics, a retrospective study of participants in an inpatient program for substance abuse in Trinidad and Tobago. Put your hands together for Keegan Kumar, please. So hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Keegan Kumar, thank you for the introduction. I'm a registrar in psychiatry at the St. John's Hospital, and today I'll be presenting my DM thesis project entitled Patient Characteristics and Completion Rates, a retrospective study of participants in an inpatient program for substance abuse in Trinidad and Tobago. So, I'll, next slide, please. Next slide. So, um, we, we heard from uh, the other presenters about the burden of mental health and substance use disorders, um, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but around the world. Um, and a little bit of background. We all know that substance use disorders is a, are, sorry, a, a major contributing factor to not only public health, but social issues in Trinidad and Tobago. There are treatments available for substance use disorders. Um, however, only one in eight persons will access this treatment. What, um, what these studies have shown is that not everyone will, who participates in treatment for substance use disorders would complete the treatment. And um, I wanted to investigate that a little bit further. Um, substance abuse treatment is available in Trinidad both publicly and privately. Um, one of the publicly available sites um, run by the Northwest Region is the Cora Substance Abuse Treatment Program. It's a very, um, it's been around for a very long time. Um, it's a 17-bed mixed gender unit and lo it's located in the Cora Hospital. Uh, next slide, please. So why did I choose the study? As I mentioned, um, as, uh, as I worked at the SAPTC for about six months or so, I noticed personally that um, people who would be very interested in completing, um, participating in this rehabilitation program, they would um, drop out um, and they would be very disappointed when you see them afterwards. So I thought that would be something that I would like to investigate a bit further. Um, we spoke a lot about um, how, uh, how, how substance use disorders affect people and I think that, you know, reducing the burden of disease uh, using this to, to reduce the burden of disease would be a, a great idea. Um, we're looking at the literature. Uh, we found approximately 30% of people on average um, tend to drop out of substance use treatment programs. And the, 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 those from the develop, um, there's, there's very limited research in the developing world. So I thought that that would be an interesting thing to look at in the Trinidadian setting. There haven't been any settings in the Caribbean region for over 20 years. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So certain, certain characteristics are associated with dropout from substance abuse treatment programs. It's, these are going to include psychiatric diagnosis, ethnicity, um, level of uh, education, employment, age, and gender. Uh, next slide. And as I mentioned before, there were only three studies done in the Caribbean region on this, on this topic, um, one of which was done in Kingston, Jamaica um, in 2008, and the, ma and the main reasons for leaving were discharging against medical advice, and it was associated with uh, particular types of substance users and the number of substance used. Next slide, please. Right. So these are the aims and the objectives of my study. Basically, I wanted to find out um, uh, what was the annual completion rate for the program at the core SAPTC, as well as to look at the characteristics associated with patients not completing the program. Uh, next question, next slide. And the research questions, which um, again, were six, there were six research questions. Um, what were the annual completion rates of the participants in the inpatient program at SABTC? What was the average length of stay of these participants? Um, what were the main reasons uh, documented for leaving the program? As well as the social, social demographic, clinical, and 
uh, substance use characteristics of those who, who did not complete the program, how did this associate um, with the completion rates? Next slide, please. So in order to, to investigate this, um, this topic, I did a retrospective review of the patient notes. We looked at a defined five-year period from the 1st of January 2017 to the 31st of December 2021. Um, it was involved um, looking at the patient notes. We did consecutive sampling, and um, the study population um, was all the patients admitted to, to the facility during this time. Next slide. Um, in terms of data collection, we looked at 25 different um, aspects. Um, mainly quant quantitative data was collected, um, and uh, it was, it was um, we used this electronic performer to, to intemper the data straight into the, into the spreadsheet. So it made data collection very, very easy. Uh, in terms of data analysis, we used diff um, descriptive and differential statistics, and we adhered to all the ethical principles. We did not collect any um, patient identifiable data or um, or have any files removed from, from, the, from the site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Thanks. So uh, in terms of results, um, basically, um, we found that there were almost four times more males and females accessing this program. The majority of the patients accessing this program were over the age of 30, average age of 43, um, on average 43.8 years. Um, most had a primary school level education, most were of East Indian descent, um, most people were employed, uh, um, most people were single or never married, and most people came from the North Central catchment region. In terms of clinical factors, this was the first time persons had participated in a rehabilitation program. Um, many of them had a psych past psychiatric history, and they had at least one family member who had a substance use issue in the past. Um, most people came as self-referrals, however, combining the three psychiatry teams from North Central, Northwest, and Southwest, um, about 30% of the referrals came from, the, came from that source. In terms of substance factors, um, most people used alcohol and they sought treatment for alcohol. Um, and most people were using more than one substance and they had their substance used, um, had eight, they started using this, this particular substance around the age of 19 and had been using it for approximately 25 years. Next slide, please. So this slide shows us the overall trend for the completion rates at the SAPTC for the study period. What we can notice, it was highest in 2017 and lowest in 2021. But I'd just like to bear in mind that 2020 and 2021, um, these were the years of COVID. So just, just bear that in mind. Um, the overall completion rate um, for, for the study was 69.9%. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is, this is very similar to the international study. So we're doing pretty good in Quora. The main, um, the, the, the average length of stay for persons in the, in, in the um, inpatient program was 13.4 days. So just, just under two weeks. Next slide, please. In terms of the reason, um, the main reason for people leaving the program, uh, we took this from the notes when it was available. Um, so most people left the program because of rule breaking. So aggression, agitation, um, using substances on your work. These were, these were the main reasons for rule breaking. Um, in terms of the other leading um, factors for non-completion would have been leaving against medical advice, they felt bored or frustrated on the wall, or they had urgent personal business to attend to. And then finally, um, the, the, the third most common reason was experiencing cravings or withdrawals for these substances. Um, next slide, please. In terms of associated factors, so I investigated 15, 15 characteristics, um, and only four of them were statistics statistically significant. So these were older age, level of social support, length of use of primary substance, and number of substance use. So people using less substances tended to stay in the program longer. Older persons and who had been using patient, um, substances for a longer period of time, they tended to stay in the program longer, or complete the program, I should say. And persons with a good or fair level of social support tended to com complete the program um, compared to people with low social support. Next slide, please. So just in terms of discussion, um, the completion rate was comparable to um, studies worldwide. We're actually doing pretty well, I think. Um, it's favorable in comparison to the other programs that reported for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, um, the National Drug Council reported that some centers reported a completion rate of about 55%. Um, we actually had 69% in Cora, so that's pretty good. Um, in terms of uh, the length of stay, the first two weeks of this program is really critical. Um, to try to engage people and recognize if they're suffering from any 
sort of withdrawals, cravings, or, or frustrating situations to try to engage them and keep them in the program so that they could, ben mac they could obtain the maximum benefit from, from, the, from the program. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's just a little bit um, about the reasons for leaving. Substance users can tend to, to be very impulsive. At times, they may sometimes be experiencing internal turmoil, withdrawal symptoms. So staff at the center really need to be aware of this and, um, re and, and recognize and intervene where possible. Next slide, please. So in terms of the demographic factors, as I mentioned before, um, older age and social support are associated with completing the program. However, it was interesting to find out, um, looking at the sample, less female and younger persons are accessing this program. So um, this is probably an uh, 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 incentive for us to look at serving the needs of this population because females and younger persons may not benefit, um, may not be able to achieve the benefit from rehabilitation program, from this rehabilitation program, sorry. In terms of clinical factors, next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so none of the clinical factors in the study were associated with completion rates. However, it was interesting to note that um, most people were doing the program for the first time. So this shows that there's a demand for inpatient rehabilitation services in the country. And it, you know, should, should tell us that, you know, we should emphasize this program and promote this program on a more wide, on a, on a more large scale basis. And the most, most people had, had previous contact with psychiatry. However, psychiatric history did not um, affect completion rates in this, in this, in, at, this, at, this, at this setting, um, which maybe indicated that we, we have good psychiatric care available at Cora. Next slide, please. And finally, substance-related characteristics. So the number of substances used and the length of substance use um, affected the completion rate. So people who use less substances, who had been using substances for a longer period, um, they actually were able to complete the program. In terms of the length of use, this probably ties into the age um, with older people completing the program. So, so that's probably why um, that's related. Overall, most people were using alcohol. So there's a demand for inpatient alcohol use, um, um, alcohol use disorder treatment. And, it, and comparing it to other sites locally, um, the treatment the use of substances was similar to other rehabilitation sites. Next slide, please. So finally, these are my recommendations. So we, we spoke about a couple before. Um, I'd just like to highlight the need for probably the decentralization of substance use services in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Cora is an excellent program. However, it's a little bit challenging to get to if you live, if, get to if you live, in, you live in quite far away. So it might be an idea to you know, um, uh, allow for the pre-treatment and follow-up programs to be done uh, in the community at the, the wellness centers. And I think that's the end of my, <laughs> my presentation. All right, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Right, thank you. Let's hear it one more time for Dr. Keegan Kumar, please. I know a lot of work would have gone into that, and of course we appreciate that. And you know, it takes a certain level of skill to uh, you know, share all that information in just a limited time, but we appreciate, of course, uh, your contribution. Next we have Dr. Now, the, the paper has researcher, so I'm assuming the assumption is a good thing sometimes, not all the time, okay. So Dr. Troy Smith, Facebook addiction user, risk profiles, identification of subclasses of addictive behaviors characterized by demographics and covariates using latent profile analysis. Put your hands together for Dr. Troy Smith, yes. Good afternoon. Next slide, please. To paraphrase Denzel Washington, are you in control of Facebook or is Facebook in control of you? Are you able to log out? Are you able to stop? Social media has become ubiquitous in the modern era and is the hub for online activities, communication, entertainment, and self-presentation. However, it has been accompanied by negative psychosocial and psychological factors which affect both objective and subjective mental wellness. 
But what is Facebook addiction? It is the excessive and compulsive use of Facebook to alter mood and to engage in the acquisition of needs, but end up with the personal effects that damage one's sense of wellness and self. Next, please. Overall, there are a number of factors that identify what is Facebook addiction. These criteria are based on Griffith's component model of addiction. Tolerance, salience, withdrawal, conflict, relapse, and mood modification. These are the same factors that would normally be used in looking at drug addictions and other behavioral addictions. Next slide, please. But what is the purpose of this study? The study is based on the concept that addictions and psychosis are heterogeneous in terms of the individuals. However, they have constellations or cluster of symptoms in different groups. Please press again, please. All right. So the hypothesis is that with regards to Facebook, there are a number of addiction profiles for different distinct characteristic clusters of symptoms within the population. Next. The study looked at a sample of university students. We got 611 university students. We use Bergen's Facebook scale as the method of identifying the determinant factor, which represents the same six criteria of addiction in Griffith's model of addiction. Later, profile analysis was used to identify the homogeneous subgroups among the heterogeneous population that were sampled, and then verified by using known covariates of Facebook addiction be it gratification in terms of content, process gratification, self-presentation, psychological factors being self-esteem and loneliness, and of course, the personality traits such as extroversism, agreeableness, openness, conscientiousness. Next. The results of the latent profile analysis identify three subclasses, which were identified as being high risk, low risk, and no risk. Next. Of those criteria that we identified earlier from Griffith's model of addiction, the two with the highest or largest effect were tolerance and mood modification. Press again, please. From that model, we identified that 8.5% of the persons who were surveyed were of the high risk of Facebook addiction, which is in line with the prevalence in terms of average, which was 12%, based on a study that surveyed 32 nations. Next. In order to confirm the relevance and the use of the model, a conditional inference was also done to identify what is the level of accuracy of using the model. We see that the accuracy was high at 92.2%, that F1 score of 0.901. However, Matthew's correlation coefficient was also used as this accounts for imbalanced data sets, given that the probability of becoming Facebook addict is very low relative to the rest of the population. So you see there would have been a drop in terms of the performance, which suggests it's very difficult to identify who will not become a victim or who will not become a Facebook addict. Next. Again, based on this model, Tolerance and mood modification accounted for 47% of the model's performance, showing again that these are the two main criteria associated with Facebook addiction. Next, please. Next. So, based on that, and identifying what is the high risk group of symptoms, we then compared it to the covariates to identify what are the actual risk factors or who will be more likely to become a Facebook addict. Firstly, in terms of demographic, we saw that females and younger persons were more likely to become addicted to Facebook or have a higher risk of becoming addicted to Facebook, which is in line with the literature in terms of females having a higher tendency for online communications and younger persons being more susceptible to addiction because they are still in developmental stages. Next. Psychological factors. Low self-esteem, loneliness. Previous studies have established that there's a link because of self-presentation 
that persons go online to try and change how they present themselves to their peers and increase relatedness and change their perception of how they are among the community. Also, in terms of gratification, all the forms of gratification, be it content, technology, the process of using the Facebook, etc., were relevant. However, the most important factor was self-presentation. We are using Facebook to identify what we want to show persons, we want to be able to represent ourselves in a particular way that we may be accepted by our community or group. In terms of personality, agreeableness, which is logical, which is linked back to the self-presentation, you have a higher desire to be liked and to have that agreeableness in terms of your community. And it links back to the, the normative beliefs in terms of the culture, because different cultures have different levels of relatedness that they desire intrinsically. Next, please. So coming down to the conclusion now, we see that there is a possibility of identifying a profile of risk. However, social problems, psychological problems, need to motivate the excessive use of Facebook. It is linked back to the factors of escapism and the needs of affordance. The anxiety to be accepted among your peers, reinvention of self in cyberspace, and to achieve the inconsistencies in terms of what is your desired connectedness versus what is, it is in the real world. The pathways are complex, as such it's difficult to identify who will not become an addict of Facebook, which is, was shown by the MCC earlier. Click, please. Next. So overall, what the study is showing is that there's a need to reframe how we interpret Facebook addiction and other social media addictions. It's not simply a matter of technology. It's not a simple matter of flow states and algorithms. It's a matter of what is the underlying factors that lead to the Facebook addiction, which are the social problems, the self-esteem, the loneliness, and the other associated psychopathologies that may lead to depression, anxiety, etc. These are the problems that we need to look at, and that's where the interventions need to be identified in terms of identifying what are the underlying factors that has led us to engage in the Facebook use in the first place, and then treat with those underlying factors so that we can move forward in terms of rehabilitation and prevention. Next slide. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope it was informative. I think that issue is a really, really important one and, and much more needs to be said about that. Uh, let's put our hands together one more time for Dr. Troy Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I, as I mentioned before, I know it takes a certain level of skill within eight minutes uh, to present, but I think um, so far we're doing exceptionally well and we're going to continue on that vein. Uh, we had carded to, to present um, Dr. Christy Samaru, but unfortunately she was not able to make it today. But fortunately, we have uh, Professor Jamil Ali in her stead to present, of course, establishing the impact of a patient-centered pilot cancer survivorship program, CSP, to enhance quality of life among breast cancer, BC, patients in Trinidad and Tobago, TNT, with the potential of dissemination across the wider Caribbean region. Let's put our hands together for Professor Jamil Ali. Thank you. Uh, my uh, student, um, Christy, is, is, is ill today, and I am going to present this particular topic. And the topic there, uh, establishing cancer survivorship program, may well be in keeping with today's uh, um, thesis, is that it is actually changing the framework of management of the patients and looking at the non physical aspects of the disease of the cancer. But anyway, that's the topic for, for the session today. Um, next uh, slide, please. So if you ask patients, if you ask people generally, not many people think that they're going to get cancer. So it's, it's really not a surprise that they're not prepared when they're aff afflicted by cancer itself. And therefore, we have actually, we tried in this particular study to, um, 
decide about outcome by looking at two concepts. One is survival and the other is survivorship. We tend to look at survival in terms of time, a time construct, how many years. But survivorship is actually looking at the patients actually dealing with their problem that they've got. And that takes into, fact, into um, consideration other aspects other than the physical illness. And so we use the term survivorship when we add life, quality of life strategies that we, we need to look at in these patients. Because this, these aspects are going to empower the patient and get the patient to have a better quality of life. So the aim of the study was to test the impact of these strategies on the cancer journey experience of these patients. So the number of patients we actually did plan to do was 61, 62 patients, but 10 of them uh, were not able to actually complete the questionnaires at the end. So we ended up with 52 patients uh, being studied. A random patients with cancer females, ages 18 to 69. And what we used generally was uh, multiple questionnaires, um, multiple choice questionnaires, and we evaluated their perceptions about uh, their feelings before and after the intervention itself. What interventions did we think about? What we did was we get we did a, a survey of the patients to find out what they considered survival. And from those, we've, we also presented to them, what about the possibility of other aspects? Would you be interested? And they, they indicated yes. So then we put those interventions in. We looked at psychosocial uh, support, nutritional support, yoga and mindfulness, spirituality, using Christian, Hindu, and Muslim counselors, and then the other part that we did not actually think, oops, sorry. Oh, they, they're not seeing it. Oh. Well, I don't have a pointer. Oh yes, okay. All right, we we had the uh, methods, right? Okay. So um, yoga and mindfulness spirituality, as I said, and one of the things that we didn't plan on, and this is what Christy did herself, is she actually asked the patients how, what would they like to do about supporting each other? And she formed a chat group. And that actually turned out to be one of the strongest element of survivorship in this because it made these patients actually group together and empowered them and they helped each other in that manner. So what we did was we looked at a pre-intervention and post-intervention scores on quality of life parameters and we used a paired T-test with a P-level of 0.01 as, as level of significance. Next slide. So the parameters we measured are as indicated on this particular slide. One is quality of life or QOL overall well-being, survivorship experience, psychosocial well-being, spiritual well-being, nutritional health, and ability to cope with challenges. And we had specific questions addressing those issues and allowed the patient to judge what their status was before the exposure to the sponsorship pro uh, survivorship program and after. And this was the, the, um, the measurements that we, these were the measurements that we used. So if you look at the next slide, please, uh, on the QOL, QW, and so on, you have the pre and the post, and we, have, uh, we had a range of, six, uh, of zero to 10, in, in, of, sorry, one to 10 in measuring the, the, the aspects of the uh, their perception in this particular uh, quality of life. The maximum would be 10, for instance. Similarly, quality, um, uh, the, the different aspects there for all of them. And 
free, you can look at each one of these, quality of life and so on. The first figure is the mean, and the other one is the standard deviation, right? And you can check those figures all along in the pre and the post, and the post figures were systemically larger, the scores were larger. That's the patient's own, the patient's own perception of how they were dealing with that aspect, the quality of life and so on. So that each of those, and when we applied the statistical analysis, all of these showed stati statistical significant difference at a, at a p-value of uh, less than 0.01 for each of those parameters. I also did a uh, measurement of these uh, actual uh, measure, um, data by using a non-parametric statistic as is more ordinarily uh, done. And the, the, the measurements were still statistically significant difference between the pre and the post uh, uh, measurements. Again, next slide. So that uh, the statistically significant differences were seen. Um, the patients recognized the difference between survivorship and survival, which is just a time constraint. And 96 of the patients supported the need to continue this program internationally and nationally. And of course, I mentioned the importance of the, of, the, of the chat group. The chat group actually was something, and it continues now. These patients continue to communicate with each other. Simple things that they do, they, they, they talk about different things like how their kids are doing. They talk about uh, trying a new recipe trying out a new song, one of them will play their music and they'll try. So they're actually communicating with each other and improving their quality of life by empowering each other and being part of their lives and supporting each other. And um, so this was, uh, uh, this was the experience that we had from the study. Next slide. So there was a demonstrated need and support for this uh, program and for its continuation. And, and uh, the patient used the term already, all of them, empowering them themselves. There was a need for a lay description of cancer concepts, and we plan to do that in the next uh, iteration of this course, of this program. They also recognized that there's a navigator that's needed, and we plan to disseminate and incorporate their suggestions in the next course. In fact, right now, the course, this course was actually uh, put into play by the um, by PAHO, and PAHO is supporting uh, efforts to actually get this internationally promulgated. Um, so the next slide. The acknowledgments are, of course, we had people from uh, PAHO, uh, Dr. Erica Wheeler, other facilitators, the psychosocial ones are list listed there, psychiatrists and social worker, a yoga. Uh, instructor, nutritionists, and other spiritual counselors, and of course, the joyous, enthusiastic uh, patients themselves. The next slide just shows our group. We met at the end of the, the um, to uh, have a good picnic together and exchange ideas, and this group continues to communicate with each other, and we hope that this particular program will be uh, promulgated internationally on the PAHO uh, support. Thank you very much. All right, Professor, um, we'll ask you to stay on. We'd like you to stay on. I'd like to call all of the oral researchers to come to the stage, be seated. So we're going to just have a few questions from our judges. So you can have a seat. Uh, Dr. Keegan Kumar, Dr. Troy Smith, and Professor Jamil Ali. So any one of the judges, you can field your questions to any one of the researchers on stage. Uh, Dr. Kumar. In one of, I think, I just wanted to be clear on your results score. 
Sure. Um, you said that the overall completion score was about 60%. 69.9%. But yeah. then when you, on the slide, I saw some representi represented figure of 30 something percent. And I didn't quite understand sure. that. If you could explain that okay, to me. Okay, so the completion rate of the program was 69.9%. So the non-completion rate, that's the percentage of people who didn't complete the program, would have been 30.1. Yeah. Okay. And that was the, yeah. okay. Yeah. My question is to Professor Ali. Yes. The indicators that were used, I'm not clear in terms of the extent to which the participants were clear on what the indicators were. I know you all had a time constraint in terms of us. <laughs> so how, how did you all establish that the terms used were terms that the participants actually all identified with as the same thing? Well, we actually worked on preparing questionnaires, and the questionnaires actually uh, reflected what they represented as their needs before, and that's how we, quote, uh, we that's how we framed the questions. And in each of those categories, there were a series of ten or twelve questions, and those questions were used to score their performance in terms of self-perception mm -hmm. of their quality of life, their well-being and so on, and that's how we develop the scores. And for each of them, of course, we could go through in this, in this presentation all the different aspects of the questionnaire. But that's how we develop the, the model to get them to self-evaluate their sense of their well-being, their quality of life, their, their ability to face problems and so on. And then we use those figures, applying the same system to, to, to uniformly look at the figures and then compare them in that fashion. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my question is directed to Dr. Smith. I note that you have used all standardized questionnaire to conduct your study. Do you think that those tools or questionnaires are culture free? If not, how it will affect the result? And it is not clear that which university you use for the study and how did you select your sample subjects? Okay, thank you for the question. So the university would have been University of Trinidad and Tobago and uh, Basically, we would have sampled the entirety of the voluntary classes based on the communication via the ethics committee. And with regards to the instruments, so based on the existing studies in social media addiction, Facebook addiction in general, uh, Bergen's Facebook addiction scale is the primary scale that is used. And one of the issues with addiction and one of the reasons probably why it has not yet been included in the DSM-5 is there are too many scales. So in order to get towards getting accepted, they need to be consistent in terms of which scales are being used in order to have comparable data when doing future studies and even when you're doing meta-analyses. Um, similarly, in terms of adding the validity to the study is why we would have used scales that would have already been established in terms of the um, UCLA three-item scale for the self-esteem, the Rosenberg scale for the loneliness, and the only scale that was not a, a, a long-running scale would have been that for gratification, but it would also would have been on a scale that would have been used in several other studies based on its initial use. And this is Dr. Kumar. Uh, your, your retrospective study of participants in an inpatient program mm -hmm. for substance abuse, your sample size was? was 269. 369. Mm -hmm. And was that a representative sample? There was, because you reviewed patients' notes. Right. Anybody, how many were excluded? What was your inclusion criteria? 
and was it, you know, could you just give me a bit more about sure, that? Sure, no problem. Um, so the inclusion criteria was all the patients admitted to the substance abuse treatment program between the 1st of January 2017 and December 31st, 2021. Okay, the um, exclusion criteria, then, well, the only patients that were excluded were files that we were missing. So there were 13 patient episodes that were missing because the files were not on site. Um, so 13 or 13? One, three. One, yeah, three. One, uh -huh. three. Um, so those were the only files that were excluded. Everyone else was included in, in, in the study. So, okay, so, so about there were about nearly 400 patients who were admitted during that time, um, but 389. Two, yeah, 200, yeah, 200, it's 289. 289, yeah. Yeah. and there were 13 patients, 13 files that you didn't have access yeah. to. Okay, fine, thank you. Thank you. All right, so is there any more questions from the, the judges? So once there, there's any more questions, uh, I want to thank the, the doctors. Thank you so very much. Of course, we appreciate your, your work and your contribution. And later on, we will find out who will emerge victorious. Put your hands together for them one more time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Dr. Keegan Kumar, Dr. Troy Smith, and of course, Professor Jamil Ali. So we have an, a, a very short uh, entertainment interlude. Of course, uh, we're going to be wrapping up in just a few minutes' time. We have the award ceremony immediately after that. Of course, simultaneous to the oral presentation, we, we had the, the poster uh, presentation being judged on the outside as well. So, so again, we have Mr. Jamal Jasani Gwen. He's going to be performing for us. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome again your very own. Put your hands together for Jamal. Thank you. 
All right, so, uh, okay, let him, because I was going and singing, you know, so. Yeah. All right, nice. Yeah. So, thank you all for listening, and so that piece, anybody can tell me the name of that piece, by chance? Anybody make it out? What song was that? So a little story about that song, right? When I was training to do my masters at Anglia, I met the grandfather of Stepan, uh, may so rest in peace, Gerald Forsyth. And I had to interview him because I had to collect um, information for the use of Stepan in music therapy. So he lived in London, so I got an opportunity to in in interview him. And Gerald Forsyth used to play with Invaders. That is like the young boys, the overall boys, right? And he taught me that song. So I was thinking, all right, what's the, what's, what's the meaning or significance behind the song, right? So the name of the song is Smile. And the first person to put words to it was Nat King Cole. But actually, this, this, that song was done for Charlie Chaplin movie. So movie without any words at the time, right? And then Michael Jackson did a version of it. So recently, tying into mental health, it, it was a featured song or theme song for which movie? Anybody could tell me? Anybody? Say, I hear it from a young man here. Joker. Yes. So, and Joker was, was, that was just like most, most recent movie, right? So I just wanted to tie that in, you know, so you all could un understand that mental health is something that's uh, significant or Present, it's present, yeah? So I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play something out. So this, this will be like uh, another famous piece for me, a, a piece I really like. So it's just, it's just melody, basically. <laughs> Say go dance, boy. I don't know. <laughs> are, are we? Are we? Are we not ready as yet? Okay. So, so let me just take this opportunity. Um, you know, you know. Many years ago, there's a little boy that sang a song uh, on TTT. That time, we only had one station. Thank God for for the revamp and the revival of of TTT. There was a song that they used to play to Phil. They used to say, "They only make enough time." They only make enough time. If you see David Rudd on the TV, where you're telling my age, bro, they're looking at me like, I don't know that song. <laughs> Anybody know that song? No. You see, the time came, the time came, my brother. I could go home and rest comfortably and say, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, serious. And I was a little boy and he, the, the, that song, I can't remember the, the singer's name. No, you remember? No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, of course, as a professional, you know, I have to make sure that I fill the gaps, but, uh, you know, to ensure that the program runs smoothly, but, of course, things happen. So, I don't know what is the, the hold back or the keep back. But uh, for those of you that don't know, of course, my name is Ken Simmons. Uh, I'm a media professional. My, my dad is, is known in the uh, media world. Um, Phil the Trill from Lab Until. You know, that's, that's my father. At least that's what it says on the birth certificate, so I have to go with that. You know, but of course, based on the facial features and the head, we can't hide. Somebody say, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we always say, no, on the head, all right. 
Um, but um, uh, if, if you're, apart from what I do in terms of voice commercials, host events of this nature and other, other stuff, I do events and all of that, um, I'm also, it could be found on Vibe City 105 FM, right, uh, on a morning drive, six, six to nine. I was recently promoted on a morning drive, and if you know anything about radio, it's, it's very hard to, to land, you know, the most important shift. So I'm grateful for the progression in my career, and of course I'm grateful for that, you know, so. Yeah. Um, I'm also um, done several commercials, the voice of, of Stag, the stories men tell, the legends they create. What's your story, Stag, a man's bear? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's all good. You know, sometimes you, you want to put a, a, a face to the voice that you hear. All right? But I'm a young man. I'm a strong, vibrant young man. Take care of myself. Some of the ladies say, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Please don't behave yourself because I want to be invited back, you know. So, um, apart from that, of course, with voiceover work, I've done stuff for B-Mobile, Digicel, Standard. Uh, recently, the, the, the big concert that is happening Redemption, apart with the, the foreign voice, is my voice. Redemption, the sounds of greatness. <laughs> delivering the meaning of life, right? Buju Banton, Beres Hammond, right? So yeah, so that's, that's me here. Yeah. All right, we ready? So I wrote all the stories here. All right, so we, we are ready to present some awards. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to call Mr. Johan Sombrano to present the Director's Choice Award for Most Progressive Research. Let's put your hands together for Mr. Sombrano. Recipient of that award, please show some love and congratulate Dr. Keegan Kumar. <laughs> so this is the Director's Choice Award for Most Progressive Research. Now, Dr. Keegan Kumar 
completion rates and patient characteristics, a retrospective study of participants in an inpatient program for substantive abuse in Trinidad and Tobago. Hard work definitely paid off. Congratulations, Dr. Stephen Kumar. Thank you very much, Mr. Johan Sobrano. And of course, congratulations going out again to Dr. So we're on to the People's Choice Award? Yes. So we gave you an opportunity to vote, and you guys did. You scanned your QR codes, and the results are in. So based on your votes, we would like to congratulate for the People's Poster Choice Award, Dr. Mahabir J. Bagan K. Justin Mahabir, how is it? So I'm reading for a bit, um, so it says Mahabir J, so I don't know what J for Justin. Put your hands together for, for Dr. Justin Mahabir. <laughs> Prevalence of medical comorbidities in female admissions to St. Anne's Hospital. And we have the acting CEO, Major Anthony Blake, to present. Thank you very much. Put your hands together one more time for Dr. Justin Mahabir. So I have to ask Dr. Leslie Roberts to, 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 to can you come please uh, to make the presentation. So when I say Dr. Leslie Roberts, she's like, yeah, like what I come to. <laughs> right. So I'm, I must make mention that what was said that based on the figures that I'm seeing here, the scores, uh, it was extremely close extremely close and it was a very difficult decision but of course we have to have one winner and uh, in uh, should i call should i call third second first or just first just first all right okay though well, thank you for not allowing me to do that all right so um let's congratulate in the oral presentation today Dr. Keegan Kumar. See, I, had, I had to pause for emphasis there. I had to. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I, would just, uh, I would just like to reiterate what our MC. I would just like to reiterate what our MC has just said in the fact that it was a very close competition. We had some difficulty in coming to deciding, but we had to have an, a winner. And I would like to congratulate Dr. Kumar because he really, you know, spoke about something that's really pertinent, relevant to the, our whole environment. And he did it in a very simple and down to earth way. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Keegan Kumar. Now, for me, I, I always like to pay attention to detail, right? So when he was announced the winner, you all see like the man have a little box coming up, you all see that? You know, like, congratulations, well, well done indeed. And of course, uh, you know, the work that you put in and you reap the rewards today. And again, congratulations to all those 
who, who did their research as as it was mentioned it was a very close one but we could only have one winner so put your hands together one more time for dr kumar congratulations so now we have the winner of the the poster uh, contribution of course the presentation the researcher and we would like to say congratulations going out to Dr. Sarah Ramjet. <laughs> Validation of the Trinidadian Primary Care Assessment Tool Adult Edition and the Assessment of Primary Care in Southwest Trinidad during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes. Congratulations. Yes, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, put your hands together for, for all the, the, the judges. Congratulations to Dr. Sir Ramjit, Dr. Kumar, and each and everybody else. Of course, uh, the fifth annual Research Day 2023. Did you guys enjoy yourselves today? Yes. And, and of course, uh, grateful to have you here. I'm grateful to be a part of it. So again, I'm charged with the responsibility to say thank you so very much to all those who have made it possible behind the scenes. Every single one of you, thank you so very much. Thank you for having me to be a part of it. I hope I did it justice, and I hope you could invite me back at some point in time. Right? Um, before, before I initially leave, let me let you know that, that um, lunch is available, or, or slightly dinner, lunch? <laughs> Uh, so, so we have on the second floor, right? So, so, so a late lunch, like early dinner, uh, available at, on the second floor. So don't leave without having something to eat. Also, we would like to acknowledge uh, today is a very, very special day for for Miss Keisha Lewis because she's celebrating her birthday today. She's the panel moderator, and of course. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Keisha. We'll not get carried away, right? <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Continue to do the great work. And I met I met Miss Lewis in, in 20. 20, at the end of 2020 when I was working with NWRHA uh, Wellness Wendy's with Ken Simmons and you know her personality just goes before her and from since then you know I appreciate I see her again today and it's good to celebrate your birthday to the, with you today so well well we have we, we have something for you afterwards but they, they, they're not allowed into the auditorium so so check we after right, right nice Right, so we're asking the, the researchers too as well, um, stay because we have your certificates uh, to, to give you before you actually leave, all right? Right, and also, right, right, and also the feedback form, please don't forget to scan the QR code and make sure that you give us good feedback and uh, let them know, say, hey, you see that MC, we did, they should have him more at, at NWRHA events, all right? And make sure they have something to eat on, on the floor too, right? Well, that's it. Thank you very much, Traveling Mercies, everyone. Take care of yourself and hope to see you very soon, all right? Take care. Bye.